Ah, the magical world of Disney. So much goes on off stage and behind the scenes to ensure that the guests have the most magical times of their lives once they arrive on the property. Ever seen a wet paint sign while walking through the parks? How about a maintenance cast member with a, a bag of tools? I mean, anyone with a construction hard hat? Of course you haven't. That would ruin the experience that Walt Disney World is perfection. It's because of that 99.99% .99 of all work goes on after the show is over. All the little mice that keep the place running like clockwork don't even start working until the announcement is made over the radios that the park is now clear. Then the crews get to work. Maintenance starts buzzing around in their golf carts. The custodial cast members bring out their large hoses to wash down every inch of the streets, the ones that we all walk on, and the construction crews are allowed past the security perimeter gates to come in and do whatever needs to be done. And that's where my story begins. See, I worked construction most of my life. When work dried up up north, I moved to Florida, where some of my family had moved over ten years ago. And naturally, I needed to find a job. I wound up applying for and getting hired by a construction company that shall remain unnamed. One that literally did almost all the construction needs for the corporate mouse. I spent five or six overnights a week at various locations at Walt Disney World with co-workers. We weren't employed by Disney, hence we were not cast members. Doing whatever our foreman told us needed to be done. Sweet gig, actually, even though it was very hard work at times. Just, I mean, just think, how many people can truly say they get to ride around the Magic Kingdom, Animal Kingdom, etc. in the dead of night in trucks, golf carts, what have you, while the park's just about empty, <laughs> except for the skeleton crew? For about the first six months, I kind of kept to myself, except for talking with the crew of the company that I work for. Then I began to notice how chummy some of the Disney overnight crew was with our staff. And custodians, when working on the same areas as us, would come over and talk to the boys as well as the overnight security cast members. I began to slowly get to know many of these folks as well. They, for the most part, were really nice. I got to know many of the night security staff, by face at least, at all four parks as well as the resorts. If you didn't know, Walt Disney World opened in 1971. It was actually not too uncommon to come across someone who had been a lifer with Disney, or knew someone who at least was. 40-plus years working for the mouse. God bless him. Even my foreman, who although did not work directly for WDW, was one of these. Boy, they have some stories to tell to pass the time. As, as I adjusted more to the job, I began to get more comfortable with the surroundings, you know? Cast members grew more social towards me, and I was able to make my way through the parks without getting, without getting lost. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's not easy when you first start working there, especially at night. Although it's not pitch black, there's very minimal lighting except for where we put our floodlights up to be able to do work. Security's only using flashlights or headlamps or their carts to light the way, you know? And store lights are only on if somebody's working in them. It's quite eerie, you know, yet cool at the same time. You know? it's like a totally different place than during the operating hours. As a matter of fact, one time when I decided to visit the park as a guest, I couldn't find a ride that I wanted to go on because it, it just looks so different during the day with all the colors, people, sounds, music. When you're working at the place full time and I had s swallowed my stupid pride and I go get a map. <laughs> it's pathetic, right? Anyway, as I, as I started conversing more and more with the cast members, some of the security staff and I found out that we had a mutual interest in the paranormal. Of course, that would come up in conversation eventually when working in graveyard shifts, you know? Well, I would get to hear stories from them all the time. The famous ghost of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, the, the murder or suicide in one of the rooms of the certain resorts, the jumping off of a terrace at another, ghosts of cast members who passed on and come back to say hi. The spooky occurrences at rides where some unfortunate guest was killed. Stories went on and on. Although fun to hear, I won't lie, it did give the whole property an ominous feel at times that a guest will never get to experience. I mean, even co-workers of mine had stories to tell. Attractions turning on even though the lockout-tagout system is in place to ensure that they don't. 
Telling someone to break a room and walking in to find no one is there. And of course the noises and the voices when they're working alone. And Ghost Hunter's jackpot. So several months ago, when arriving at work, the foreman called our team over for a meeting. He announced that he'd be starting a new assignment in the Magic Kingdom shortly. We'd be working on the Seven Dwarves Mine Train ride. This attraction would be opening later on in the year. I mean, how exciting, right? Up until now, my crew, since I had started with them, had been doing mundane, I mean, yet necessary assignments. We had the pleasure of pouring concrete, digging ditches, fixing bathrooms, you know, good stuff. And now we we're actually going to be working on an attraction. Imagine me getting to tell my future wife and children that I helped make this as we were writing it. They'd be in awe, and they'd be so proud, and... The building was already up for the most part. We were going to be working on making it show ready. You know, making a building look like a mine inside and out. Fabricating rocks, uh, fixating jewels, the works. When the time came to start this, he had us meet inside of the cast member break rooms inside the attraction. For those of you that don't know, most, if not all, attractions have break rooms inside of them that the public can't see. Cast member working the ride literally doesn't have to leave it, you know, if he or she doesn't want to, even for a lunch break. He explained the job, you know, who would be doing what each week, and all the normal details. Then he proceeded to tell us that as per Disney management, we were to take our lunch breaks at 3 o'clock a.m. and to only take it in this particular break room that we were in. And I thought that was kind of weird. You know, since my employment with them began, we were never told when and where to take our lunch. We used to always stagger our breaks as well as so that most of the crew was always working. Whatever, I guess. The mouse paid our bills. Who the hell was I to question it? I was still the rookie, you know, but I was... I will say this. I saw what I was thinking in the eyes of my co-workers as well. There were only a group of ten guys on this assignment, and we were broken up into groups of five. One group would work on the outside, one group on the inside of the attraction. I was in the inside group. It was a pain to work in the thing, you know, due to the size of the spaces where we had to work. Maybe... One or two floodlights would fit in the area we were working. Give an effect of staring into a fire in the woods. While working in a wall, it was bright as hell. When you came out of that space, you were blind as a bat. The first few days, it became a, a running joke or a contest of who tripped on something and broke their ass the most each week. And they'd have to pay for drinks when we went out together. I paid up twice the first month. Yeah, thanks, Disney. I guess you could call me paranoid. But I would never leave my lunch bag in the fridge in the break room. See, I'm I'm an absolutely angry asshole if I'm hungry. After having it stolen once, well, at Animal Kingdom, I'm not going to have it happen again. So I carry it around with my other gear from then on. We were working on the opposite side of the attraction from the break room. It was just, it was just about lunchtime. You know, we cleaned up all the possible trip hazards we went on break. Then, when we got to the break room, I realized I'd left my bag where we were working. I mean, damn it, I'm not going to spend $8 on a Coke and a stupid bear claw from one of the Disney rip-off vending machines. So I told the guys, I'm going to run back to get my bag. So off I went. I was hurrying along because we only had about a half an hour for lunch. And if we take even a minute longer to get back to our work location, there's hell to pay. And you all know how fast a half hour flies by, unless you're working. Now, trying to make good time, I must have made a wrong turn in all the blackness. A stupid flashlight was in my tool bag, of course. I was attempting to feel my way around the track when I saw some light coming up ahead of me. They looked like they'd be a set of emergency lights, but they were quite dim or flickering. I mean, who cares? Any port in the storm, right? So I slowly made my way towards them and began to hear voices. But I couldn't make out any words. Well, there was no one in the attraction other than us. Or so we were told. So, oh my god. You know? And after all the stories I was told, was I finally going to have one of my own? As much as I felt the hairs in the back of my neck stand up, I was excited as well. Even though I really like hearing about ghosts, I can't say that I'm really truly afraid of them. I just don't want them in my home. <laughs> other than that... I find the idea of them fascinating, you know, and so I, I slowly peeked my head around the next corner. I wish to God 
Yeah, it was a ghost I saw. It was a large, at least compared to where we were working, open space, and there was a fabricated stone slab made to look like a natural rock formation in the center. Six figures in suits were around it in a circle. Five were holding candles, while one was reading off of what looked like an old piece of parchment. What he was saying was beyond my knowledge, not English from what I could tell. Every time the main suit would finish a sentence or two, the others would repeat the last word. And as I crouched there, amazed, I saw what looked like a, a flash of yellow and blue stirring from on top of the altar. There was something on it. A woman. She stirred again. I, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. It looked like one of those those college program kids. The ones that get to uh, be friends with the characters. Completely dressed as Snow White. She was gagged and bound. What the hell was I seeing? Her eyes were huge, filled with fright. Tears were streaming down her face, making her overly done makeup run. As much as she struggled, she could barely move. The man with the parchment stopped reading. The others all produced some crudely made daggers and made their way to her. Two of them went to each of her arms, two of her legs, and one stood at the top of her head. The leader, for, for lack of a better word, made a gesture with his hands and said one more uncomprehensible word, and the others moved in. The two by her arms sliced her arms from bicep down to wrist. The two did the same for the mid-thigh and the top of her feet. The fifth one actually carved what looked like a half-moon into her forehead. I stifled a scream and I closed my eyes. I could hear muffled screams and I could smell copper in my nostrils and taste it in the back of my throat. I opened up my eyes briefly to see the leader produce a knife, walk over to the altar and lift poor Snow White's chin up towards him. And that's when I turned and ran. I got back to the break room, sprinting through the door. I must have looked half-crazed because one of my buddies said, What the hell happened to you, and where's your lunch bag? I didn't even answer him. I just stood there. He looked me over one more time and decided to call the foreman over the radio. One, have him to come over and talk to me. The foreman came in, took one look at me, and asked if I was feeling okay. I shook my head. He told me to go home for the remainder of my shift. I called off for the next three days. In the comfort of my home, I attempted to rationalize what had happened. You know, it, it had to have been a gag, right? Hey, was it my boys with an elaborate welcome to the crew trick? I, I mean, God. I, well, Disney World is crammed full of college program kids, right? So late teens, early 20s, away from home, on college, getting paid crap just so they could... They could put Disney on their resumes, just fornicating and causing havoc every chance they get, playing tricks so they can put it in their blogs or their Twitter or whatever stupid thing they use to get attention, right? It had to be. So my first night back to work, I literally had to force myself not to turn my car around at the security gate when the guard opened it for me to enter. When I get to the break room, one of the lifers I worked with was sitting there, seemingly waiting for me. They told me to clock in leave my stuff with him, and go meet the foreman over by the main entrance. I looked at him quizzically, since it was, it was pretty far away from the mine, and it was heavily frowned upon for us non-cast members to be found wandering far from where we were assigned. I stated as such, and he just said, go, you'll be with your boss, so it would be his ass and not yours if someone says something. So I made my way over to the main entrance, I found him under the train station. He's sitting on one of those benches. He told me to sit. Wait there for about five minutes. He lit up a cigarette. And, uh, I did as well. I mean, during the night shift, you could get away with this if you're careful about it. And he asked me what had happened the other night. I shrugged. I looked to the newly hosed down ground and I... I felt exhausted. He put his hand on my shoulder and he said that I was a great co-worker. The other guys all liked me a lot. He didn't want to lose me. 
and that he was surprised I came back after the way I'd looked. I told him that it wasn't far from the truth. He asked me if I was just sick or if something had happened. He also asked me if maybe a cast member manager had given me a hard time, and if so, he'd handle it. I shook my head. They said that he wouldn't believe me. He'd probably fire me for being a nut if I told him. And then he said something that made me feel like it was okay to tell my story. He said, I've worked here since it was just flat land and dirt roads. Nothing you can say will shock me. So I looked up at him and I looked him dead in the eyes. And when I saw that he was telling the truth, I began to explain everything from the beginning. I ended the story when the other guy told me to come see him. My foreman sat there, flicked his cigarette butt, ground it into the floor. It was a huge Disney no-no. He had sat there nodding through the entire story, not interrupting once. Never, never once a smirk, a smile, a look of disbelief. A custodial truck happened to drive by, and when the headlights flashed on us, it seemed that all the blood had seemed to drain from my foreman's face. He breathed in and exhaled once from the mouth. At the beginnings of tears rolling in his eyes, he finally spoke. I'm about to tell you, kiddo, not many here have been here long enough to know, and those who do know almost never speak about it. It's sort of a taboo subject, and the few that do talk about it are too old to care or have one too many scotches. He smiled half-heartedly at this, and I thought maybe he might stop, but he continued. I've lived in this area for almost 80 years. I've barely been out of this state. Less times that I can count on one hand. Orlando's only looked this way for a short time. If you could have seen this land in the time I grew up here, you would be amazed. Marshland, orange groves, nothing else. Until Uncle Walt decided that this would be his spot for his next incredible theme park, there was practically nothing. Humans have been inhabiting this land for a very long time. The Eyes, the Apache, the Calusa, the Temuqua, all native Indians that lived in or around the land that you're sitting in right now. The Paleo Indians were here before them. You know, ancient land. Uh, I'm no historian, but I guess them Indians at some point figured out that this land was a little spoiled. Spoiled as in not just bad, but spoiled as in how a little child throws a tantrum if it doesn't get its way. You know, at some point, when these cultures were not having good weather or crops and what have you, they figured out that a blood sacrifice, well, a blood sacrifice could do the trick. And every time they built a large structure in this area, they drew blood. But for whatever reason, sacrifice had to do with the structure being built. And for example, if the Indians were building a religious structure, the shaman had to be sacrificed. If a settler was building a barn or an orange grove, a farmhand had to be the one. You get me? And it had to be done by the elders of the town. It couldn't be done by just anyone. But the elders are the most influential ones in the area. I mean, have you seen that movie? It's a pet cemetery, the one by Stephen King. Like that, you know, but the, but the important people involved. Do you know the story about how Disney bought this land? He bought it not under the Disney brand, but hundreds of pseudo companies. He didn't want anyone to know he was going to build a theme park here, because the locals may not have sold it as cheaply as they did. So he did what he did. And I, I wonder if, through all this half-truth bargaining, if him, his round-table executives... Have they ever wondered why so many were willing to sell at that price? Were they done having to do the despicable to make a profit here? Did so many of them want out? It could really make you wonder. Now come supposedly no one dies at Disney. How come all people are proclaimed dead off the property? Why do, why do we hire so many college kids that are supposedly running rampant here? Think about it. 
I just gotta tell you because I think I think you may deserve it after what you've seen. The powers that be here, they're powerful. More powerful than being Disney executives. They pretty much rule everything. You think Club 33 is exclusive? <laughs> the club you stumbled upon rules more than just a theme park. If you think about what you've seen, your life may be in danger. And if you talk about what you've seen, your life may be in danger. I just sat there. Trying to soak in what I just heard. This was insane. And then my foreman said one more thing before the last sentence I ever said to that nice man. If you think that was bad, just imagine what I heard as we were building the small world. I swear I still hear those screams of those kids when I close my eyes. So even 40 years after. My reply? I quit. <sighs> the magical world of Disney. I still get the shakes when I think about it. I hate every fucking Disney commercial that comes on TV. And they come on a lot. I get goosebumps every time. I see Universal's hiring, and I do need work. Should I apply? Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Cookie Pasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to tell you about another book that's available from Cryptic Nightmares. I mean, also, the, he, he also has the other books that you guys are probably more familiar with that are My Tiny Town Was Put on Lockdown, part one and part two, but... He just released a new book this last weekend called Shadows of My Mind, a horror story anthology. And it comes from everybody's post-apocalyptic, purple fog surviving author, Cryptic Nightmares. And now, on to tonight's story. They say that just before you die, your life flashes before your eyes. The life you lived up till that point filled with all your happiness and all your sorrows, all your good decisions and your bad decisions. Your life from start to finish races through your mind in little more than a blink. There's very little, if any, actual proof that this happens. The reason there's no proof is that to truly know means that you would have to die. <laughs> well, I spent most of my life alone, struggling with depression. I felt and watched as it slowly chews away in my psyche. Each new bout of sadness steals from me another little part of my soul, another little piece of myself lost into the ether. On my age of 33, I've seen many of the so-called friends come and go. Family members lost and gone with nobody bothering to tell me until months later. And I found out from a random comment on some social media platform that I mustered up the courage to check that day. Well, that was the way that I found out that my mother had died. Nearly two months prior. I never got any notice or calls from either of my two siblings or any of my relatives, actually. To their defense, I would say that they both apologized profusely and each of them came to my little secluded country house to visit me. They all only lived within an hour from each other, and while they were over, we all had decided that we would spend a lot more time together. We agreed that we needed to strengthen our relationship and be there for each other much more than we had in the past, now that both of our parents were gone. My father wasn't dead, though. He had left shortly after my younger brother was born, and we hadn't heard a word from him since. I'd gotten hopeful at the prospect of having my siblings become more a part of my life and helped me to develop a support system to relieve me of some of the overwhelming depression that I faced so often. After that day, however, they never came back. Or even called. My little glimmer of hope that had been teased in front of me, the enticing shimmer of having helped to pull me from my perpetual sadness had been very quickly pulled from my sight. 
I lost my job shortly after, and my breaking point had finally been reached. My problem seemed completely insurmountable. I felt like I truly had nothing left to give the world. I sat there with tears in my eyes, staring down the barrel of a shotgun while I sat on my living room couch. I was convinced that nobody would even find me because nobody cared. And for that reason, I never even bothered to write any notes to whoever might come upon me. I stuck my bare toe in the trigger guard and suddenly, suddenly I felt like I was no longer in my body. Well, I hadn't moved, but I also no longer felt like my physical self. Suddenly everything felt like it was moving in slow motion. I heard the click of the gun, the explosion in the chamber. I watched as the pellets were suddenly uncased and rocketed through the barrel at me. I watched as my own blood and brain matter spattered across the walls, and I watched as little drips of blood began to run down. I could see as the particles of gray matter began to slide down the walls, resting softly on the floor. I watched as my body slowly slumped over on the couch, now lifeless and limp. I watched as the gun fell to the floor, slipping from my suddenly limp hands. The sensation of my physical body changing position and falling away from where my consciousness still sat was eerie at best. I sat for what felt like an eternity with my head turning looking at my body laying sideways on the couch, both mine and my physical body's legs occupying the same space. As I sat up looking around, the torso of my physical body lied limp across the couch. I finally stood up and turned and looked. Nothing less of a complete state of shock at the horrific display that I'd created. What felt like an eternity passed as I stood horrified at the terrible decision I'd made. Only a few small chunks of brain tissue still slowly slid down the wall as the screen on my phone lit up as it sat on the coffee table in front of my body. It was a text from my sister. A small notification said that she was sorry for being so long since we spent time together and that she loved me. She asked if I was busy and suggested we go out to get dinner together that night. Completely unable to interact with my phone as a response, I could do nothing but cry as I stared at the message. I... I regretted my actions so tremendously and now could only wish that I had waited just a few more minutes. I told myself that her gesture and her text would have completely changed my entire perspective, changed my mind. I was so angry at myself for being so impatient, so weak that I couldn't wait just a little longer. According to the screen on my phone, another hour passed before another text came through. Again, it was my sister letting me know that my brother had asked to join us for dinner and nearly begging me to respond to her so that we can get plans finalized. I hated myself so much for not waiting, not holding out a little longer at the sight of that message. Another half an hour had passed before a third message appeared on my phone. I never left where I was. When I first stood up, feeling, feeling rooted and unable to move from that spot for hours. The third message just said that since I wasn't responding, they'd try again another time. As the sun set that first night, the house got very dark, since I was unable to interact with any of the switches, and had no light left on when I sat down to take my life. I still stood in my living room in my dark and silent house, unable to do anything but wander. I cried for hours at the sight of my own lifeless body lying on the couch and regretting my selfish decision with every fiber of my being. I tried making friends with the shadows, but with no light on, there were no shadows to be cast around the house. Slowly, another day passed. More texts came in on my phone, which were more activity than I had seen in months. All the messages were from my siblings, asking if I had been okay, trying to set up various activities for the three of us to do together. I could do nothing but just let the messages sit unread as my body began to rot and decay. Only three feet from my phone. I began to hear odd grumbles coming from the darkness that third night. 
It sounded like a deep, scratchy voice, but muffled, so I couldn't make out the words. At first, I had been almost excited at the idea of someone to talk to. But that feeling quickly faded as soon as I noticed that it started repeating. As if it were some sort of demonic incantation. The same few phrases began to repeat over and over. I, I called out to whatever may be listening or speaking, dis desperate for some some change, any glimmer of hope, that whatever it was could take me back, let me change my mind, anything. Without pause, the voice continued for hours. Other voices joined in until it was a choir of deep, heavy phrases. With every new voice added, the words became clearer. And at last I could tell that it was all in some foreign language that I wouldn't even begin to be able to identify. And that's when I saw it. For the first time, the first one just a flicker out of the dark shadows of the corners. The shadows of the night finally appeared because of a bright, full moon that night. It was small, only about as tall as my knee. Muscular, but extremely thin and sinuous. Horns, spikes adorned its head and shoulders. Its long arms, short legs caused the creature's knuckles to drag along the ground as it ran between the shadows. Its skin was as black as midnight, and hints of blood red at its joints. The creature's mouth was oversized, taking up nearly half of its smaller-sized head. It had long pointed ears, and I had no other way to describe it other than it looked like some sort of imp or demon. As soon as it reached the darkness of the next shadow, it melded with the blackness of the corner, and, and it was gone. I began noticing them more and more as I walked around the house aimlessly. The satanic incantations got louder and louder, and the imps began to show themselves more and more, becoming less cautious and lingering amongst the moonlight for longer and longer each time. They seemed to be following me from room to room, and fear began to rise in my mind, curious about what they might want from me. The question of if they even could do anything to me in this out-of-body state that I was in. Just as that question flashed in my mind, a deep billowing laugh boomed through the house, reverberating off the walls. The sinister chuckle sounded like it had come from some being with unfathomable size. For the rest of the night, I stood by a window, just hoping that the light of the moon would keep the various demons from getting to me. I listened to the chanting all that night as the volume rose and fell. Just before the first light of day peeked over the horizon, I heard the deep, massive voice for the first time. Your fear smells delicious. As I watched the light begin to brighten the sky, I saw a vehicle pull into the driveway. It was my sister. She had come to check on me since I hadn't responded to her, or my brother, and my phone had finally run out of all power two days before. She was about to walk into my house and see my body rotted and decayed, slumped over on the couch. She would see the gun lying on the floor, having slipped from my hands. There was absolutely nothing I could do to stop her. I screamed and I pleaded for her to stay out as I tried to hold the front door closed. No matter how hard I cried or loud I yelled, no sound echoed through the air. Her knocks grew louder and louder until she decided to just turn the handle and open the door. The door just phased through me as it opened, as if I took up no more space in the air around me. Oh Jesus, what is that smell? It smells like... She said as she opened the door. I knew that if she would have finished her sentence that she had realized the smell was rot. More specifically, the smell of rotting flesh. My rotting flesh. I watched as she called out to me while she rushed through my home. All I could do was follow her around, dreading the moment she moved into the living room. I felt nothing but pure shame for what I had done. It was every bit as horrible as I expected when she walked in. She turned the corner, still covering her nose with her hands. I watched as her hands fell to her chest and a scream erupted from her throat. She burst into tears and called my brother before calling the police. She screamed and cried from the doorway, refusing to enter the room where my... 
rotted corpse lay on the couch. Her conversation with my brother was very ineffective through the sobs and anguish, but she was able to get out enough words to tell my brother to come to my house. Before she dialed the police, her knees gave way, and she crumpled to the floor. My sister never stopped crying. Even after my brother had shown up and walked into my house, he also began to cry, and my siblings held each other crying on the front steps until the police showed up. I hadn't realized how much of an effect my choice would have on other people in my life, and the sight of them so devastated by me being gone only caused me to regret what I had done so much more. The police did their best to take statements from my siblings as they attempted to speak through tears and sobs. All I could do was stand there and watch as the coroner picked my lifeless body off the couch and shoved me into a bag to take me outside to the van. Everyone finally left just before the sun started going down that day. I stood in the living room, standing in silence and looking out over the blood stains covering the walls. I could see the dark brown stains on the couch where it was once the shiny, warm, crimson pools of blood where my body had been lying. My chest hurt worse than I could ever imagine since my physical body was gone, but still I could feel everything. It seemed even worse than when I had been in my body. Sinister laughs and grumbles began to emit from the darkness just as the sun dipped below the horizon. I had no idea what they could even do to me, but I could feel that they were after me for some reason. With each minute that passed, the imps got braver, leaving the shadows to taunt me for longer each time. The deep, booming voice erupted from time to time, speaking simple sentences, threats, and cryptic riddles that I swore just were to make me feel uncomfortable. I had no idea just how malicious the voice was. Soon it will be time. You are nearly ripe. The voice broke the eerie silence, causing me to jump out of fear. Who's there? What do you want from me? I called out into the darkness at the strange and sinister voice. Nothing but complete and utter silence responded to my question. Standing completely alone and surrounded by darkness with nothing but my own thoughts and regrets to keep me company, the smell of the leftover rot for my corpse was vile, and I wish I could say that I would be able to get used to it, but I never would. It lingered in the air as a constant, painful reminder of my selfish decision of giving up on life. The few of the imps that lurked among the shadows skittered around the room, laughing and whispering to each other, far too quiet for me to be able to understand what they were saying. Suddenly, a searing pain came from my leg, and I looked down to see slashes in my ghostly form. An imp had just run past and dug its claws along my leg, tearing into me. There were so many questions that flew through my mind. The pain itself was intense and crippling, which led me to my biggest question. How could I, in, in this out-of-body-like state, feel any physical pain? In all honesty, it really didn't matter how. The fact was that I could. It was very real and very vivid. A chorus of high-pitched laughter erupted from the darkened shadows of the room as I doubled over in pain. The cut was deep, but no blood poured from the wound. I screamed out in pain on my knees as another imp ran by and slashed across my chest, tearing another three very deep cuts. I could feel as the claws bounced and dug along the bones beneath my skin. The pain was immense, but I, I couldn't even pass out due to not being more than a ghost at that point forced to stay, tormented and tortured by these little demons. I lied on the floor, writhing in pain that never seemed to subdue for the rest of that night. Oh, while the little creatures howled and laughed at me from the dark corners of the room. Just before the sun broke the horizon, in that perfect darkest before the dawn moment, the booming voice spoke one simple sentence. One that both confirmed my own thoughts and terrified me at what the meaning behind it was. Your choices bring only pain. Again I cried into the darkness, asking who was there? Whose voice kept haunting me? 
No response came and only left me wondering if it meant that my suicide only brought pain to my loved ones, or that it meant I would have nothing but endless pain. The cuts and gashes I had already sustained didn't seem like any of the pain was subsiding, even in the least. As the sun rose over the horizon and into the dull blue sky, I forced myself to rise to my feet and began to walk towards the door. I had no desire to stay in that forsaken house anymore. I thought that it might get me away from the imps and whatever else it was that had decided to hole up in what was now essentially just an abandoned house. I reached the door and gripped the handle. But no matter how hard I turned my hand, the doorknob wouldn't budge. Then it hit me. A realization. A memory. That explained why I couldn't turn the knob. In my panic and frustration, my burning desire to get away from these painful demons and horrible thoughts brought on by this house, I had forgotten that I no longer had the ability to interact with the world around me. I, I could only move within it. I couldn't flip on light switches. I couldn't turn door handles. Move objects. Nothing. I was essentially trapped in my own mind and left with nothing. Except the despair and regret left behind from my poor choice. As I stood there at my door, letting the realization of being trapped in my house sink in, I was struck in the back of my other leg, causing me to come crashing to the ground. When I hit the ground, laughter from the imps erupted from behind the furniture in the corners of the room that I couldn't see. Sinister, taunting phrases were barked at me by the creatures hidden amongst whatever shadows they could find in the daylight and beamed through the windows. All I could do was sit in pain, staring at the bloodstains on the walls as the day went on, wishing that I had been able to grow numb to the pain or at the very least to the smell of the rot. But it never happened. Fear once again rose in my throat as the sun began to set at the end of the day. The shadows in the house grew bigger. I noticed that the imps would grow louder and more daring as the darkness flooded my house again. I did my best to stay inside whatever light remained, but eventually, my country house was bathed in pure darkness. A cloud-covered sky that night didn't even allow the moon to shine in through the windows. I sat in the pitch black of the night in pain and fearing for a life that I'd technically already given up on. I had no idea that even after death I was able to still feel this much pain and suffering, but it was very much real. Just as the question of how it could be flashing in my mind, the grumbles from the small demons fell silent and the deep booming voice of the entity I hadn't seen yet filled the air. The pain you have chosen will be eternal. You will forever know only pain, amplified by the pain and suffering you have caused to those around you. Who are you? What do you want from me? I cried out to the voice, doing my best to hold back the sadness in my voice. The voice only replied with a billowing, sinister laugh, with the added chorus of the small demons laughing along with. I suddenly felt claws touching my leg as I lied crying on the floor of my house. I kicked at the claws in the darkness and yelled out to whatever was touching me. Get back! Don't touch me! My cries were met with a growl just before I was attacked by numerous of the imps. Their claws pierced my body and they bit and scratched at my thighs until they tore and ripped my leg clear from my body. The rip of my flesh was excruciating and the imps howled as they left me lying there and ran off with my leg into the corner of the house. I was in so much terrifying pain that I wished that I could pass out, but I was unable to due to my current state. After a few hours of nothing but seething pain and listening to the grumbles and laughter of the imps as they chewed on my leg, I tried to stand on my one remaining. The second I pulled myself up, one of the demons slashed at my ankle, bringing me back down to the floor. As I hit the ground again, the rest of the creatures rushed at me, cutting, biting at my body before ripping an arm from me. I could do nothing but twitch on the ground, as if being in the middle of a, of a grand mal seizure from the pure agony. No blood poured from my wounds, only pain. The deep demonic voice boomed laughter throughout the night, and only faded as the sun rose and the light began to pour in from the windows. All I could do was lay still, delirious from the pain. For how long I lay there, I wasn't sure, but I heard the front door open and my sister walked in, followed by my brother. And after a few steps inside the house, they both broke into tears and held each other for a very long time, crying. 
crying before my brother spoke. I know it's hard, but we need to start going through his stuff. Try to get some of these things sorted out. It smells like death in here. I'm not sure I'll be able to concentrate with all the memories flooding my mind. My sister replied to him through tears and broken words. The police took the body, but they, they left the mess, so we need to clean up first. Get rid of the smell, said my brother. Wait, so you mean to tell me that there's still blood and brains all over the walls and the couch in the living room? My sister asked. Yeah, sadly, yes. Uh, I'll do my best to clean that up if you want to stay out of that room. I think we should just uh, move the couch out back, toss it on the burn pile. You know, less to clean. However, uh, however, I will need your help to move it. My sister nodded in agreement and helped him move the couch, but broke into tears again as she stepped into the living room of my house. Seeing them both crying and hurting so much filled my heart even more with regret. Still, in so much pain, I could do nothing but lie there on the corner and watch my family move the couch outside. They took a lot of breaks getting the couch out to stop and cry because my sister could barely handle the loss of me. I'm sorry! I take it all back, I yelled, and repeated as loud as I could, but my words never translated into any audible noise they could hear. Slowly, a figure materialized standing next to me as I lay on the ground. He was the source of the booming voice I had kept hearing. He was wearing a tattered cloak that was black, so dark that it seemed to absorb everything around it, as if it were a cloth made from a black hole. Humanoid in shape and stance, there was there were long bony spikes protruding from the back of the cloak, coming from the creature's shoulders and down its back, and its oversized hood kept the creature's face veiled in darkness, except for its long snout that protruded from the edges of the hood. The decrepit looking mouth was filled with jagged and sharp teeth that looked randomly placed into the creature's jaws. A brown and bony hand extended past the edges of the cloak, long and flowing sleeves. Each bony digit ended in a yellowed, jagged, and long talon that I would imagine only a large bird of prey having. Clutched in the creature's hand was a long and gnarled black staff, made from some archaic wood from a tree that I was sure had most likely been extinct for eons. The beast stood watching silently next to me as I lay on the ground, missing two of my limbs and writhing in pain. My brother and sister, having finished moving the couch, gathered a bucket of bleach and other cleaning supplies, began to try to clean up the blood stains off the wall as best they could. I knew that the stains themselves would probably never go away, so I assumed that they were cleaning through tear-filled eyes to at least eliminate the smell of rot and decay that infested the house. My siblings were only able to clean for a short while before my sister broke down and started both crying and yelling out. I can't do this anymore. Why did he do this? Why did he leave us like this? I have to get out of here. My sister said as she picked up the bucket of bleach and sent it crashing against the wall, splashing its content everywhere. Look, I, I wish I knew. I miss him too. Let's try to come back a different day. My brother responded as he helped my sister who collapsed in tears in the doorway up and outside of their cars. Regret churned in my stomach, and my heart ached at the sight of my family crying so hard over me. Thoughts began to flood my mind of how I would never be able to see my siblings' kids again, how I had selfishly taken their uncle from them. My train of thought went quickly, derailing as the creatures turned to face me. A thin forked tongue poked through his jagged teeth and his mouth opened slightly. He began to speak, and I noticed that these words escaped his throat, but his mouth never moved. The hood kept most of his face in darkness, and I found myself morbidly curious and hoping to be able to see his eyes, although the chance never revealed itself. Now you see the pain you burden others with. His words hit me hard because I knew what he meant. No sooner than the words escaped his throat did he slowly lean down to where I was lying. The hand not grasping the staff slowly reached out, and I watched as the talons on his fingers pressed into my stomach, tearing the flesh and wrapping around my intestines. The creature pulled my organs out and spread them on the floor near me as I screamed in pain. 
feast, little ones. His last words before he faded into nothing. I didn't know which was worse. The intense pain I felt all over my body or the sight of all the imps chuckling to themselves as they crept towards me. They quickly descended upon me and began eating my intestines and fighting over who would get the last bite. I did my best to try to use my one arm and one leg to fend them off. However, it only seemed to anger them. And they soon grabbed my remaining limbs, tore them from me violently. It was worse than any pain I could ever imagine, but no way to escape it. No way to pass out or fall unconscious because of how intense it was. There was no sedatives, no relief, just pure unbridled pain. And I could do nothing about it as I was reduced to nothing but a screaming and crying torso. I lay there crying and in more pain than any human should ever be able to be in. While the small demonic creatures feasted on my limbs and organs. Awake and alert for every excruciating second as I watched them devour me alive. And once they finished consuming my limbs and my organs, the creatures began to close in on me again. And all I could do was scream as they began slashing and biting at what was left of me. As more of me was being bitten and ripped away, the large cloaked demon formed over me. Between the slashes I watched as a spindly talon adorned hand reached down and wrapped its cold fingers around my neck. The huge creature lifted my battered torso up by the throat effortlessly until our faces were inches from each other. The creature's mouth opened wide as if it were about to take a bite out of my face, and its long and forked tongue brushed up against my cheek as he spoke again without moving his mouth. You will know. Only pain. His words echoed off the walls as they sounded. His mouth widened even further, and I wish I could close my eyes to avoid watching as I was eaten, but my eyelids had already been torn and bitten off, along with other scratches and bites all over my face. The demon pulled me in close, and I could feel his long and jagged teeth begin to sink into me as he bit down over my head, and I screamed out, truly confused, that I could even experience any more pain than I was already in. And suddenly, as I was... Screaming and everything in my surroundings shifted and faded away and everything went went black for a split second. My eyelids were back and as I opened my eyes, with tears running down my face, I was looking down the barrel of a shotgun while sitting on my couch. Somehow I was back to the moment just before I pulled the trigger. Fear flooded my body as the thought of having to go through all of that again and I pushed the gun away letting it fall to the ground. It took everything in me to finally catch my breath and calm my heart, and I still had no real answer for what had just happened to me. Just, But I did know that I wanted to be no part of whatever it was. I glanced down and I noticed my phone sitting on the edge of the coffee table. Quickly, I reached out to grab it and call my brother or my sister, but just as I picked it up off the table, it chimed in my hand and the screen lit up. It was my sister, but instead of responding or even reading the message, I pressed the button to call her. Hey Chris, how are you? Mike and I have been missing you. Did you, do you want to get dinner tonight with us? I mean, we could just do like a sibling outing. What do you think? She said, answering the phone. It took me a moment before I could gather the courage to tell her what was screaming inside my skull for so long. I eventually burst into tears on the phone before I finally spoke. I, I love you so much, Amber. Both you and Mike, but... I paused to deal with another flood of tears before I could continue. I I've been so sad, and I've been so d depressed lately, and I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm not doing well. I, I need help. Okay. Okay, well, just sit tight. I'll head over right now. You, me, and Mike, we can all go out to dinner together later tonight, okay? Sure enough, Amber pulled into my driveway. And to my surprise, Mike pulled in behind her very shortly after. She must have called him on her drive, and they both decided to come, and I opened the door just as they reached the front porch, and they both greeted me with big... Warm, loving hugs. We all got dinner that night. It's been a weekly tradition ever since. I see their, their families, their kids a lot more. More often now that we've put in effort to remain a part of their lives. I see a counselor regularly now. 
and I'm doing better. I'm feeling better lately. They say that just before you die, your entire life flashes before your eyes, but they're wrong. So very wrong, it is. There's no sugar-coated, frosting-lined memory montage of all the times your grandmother kissed you or every moment that you got embarrassed in class by a teacher. What you see in that split second just before you die is the torture and pain that goes on once you're dead. The hurt you cause others with your absence and the sadness. They feel when they miss you when you're gone. That is the life that flashes. I awoke to the sound of my phone buzzing on the bedside table. Hello? I said groggily. You're that paranormal hunter, right? I had the website changed, new business cards made up, and even sunk some money into an ad campaign. Still. All callers insisted on referring to me as the paranormal hunter. A term originally coined by tabloid papers who made me out to be some sort of monster-fighting hero. It wouldn't be so bad if it didn't negatively affect my livelihood. Those articles made me a laughing stock to skeptics everywhere, including the local authorities that I sought to work with on occasion. Actually, it's Paranormal Consultant. Right, sorry. I need your help. She sounded like the rest. Scared. Confused. And at the end of her rope. I was the last call anyone made in a situation like this. A desperate cry for help when all else failed. It's as if dialing the number was some admittance of insanity, or worse, a confirmation that the things that go bump in the night are really out there, waiting in the shadows to pounce on their next victims. I'm here to help. What can I do for you? She let out a long sigh before continuing. Well, you're not going to believe this. That's what they all say. I received this odd list of rules in the mail. I didn't pay it any mind at first, thinking it's a mix-up at the post office, but now, every time I unknowingly break a rule... Let me guess. There's some sort of strange, paranormal consequence. Yes, exactly! How did you know? Lists like these had been popping up all over the country. Some in hotel rooms, others in apartments or employee manuals. They are all the same. Paranormal calamity befalls any victim who will refuse to follow the guidelines. When enough rules are broken, it usually results in the person's death. Not to worry. I've dealt with this kind of thing before. I'll take your case. Just text me your address and I'll be right over. Thank you so much. I wasn't sure that you'd believe me. And my line of work pays to have an open mind. After disconnecting and throwing on some clothes, I got into my car and took off in the direction of her house. It was in town, so the drive was a short one. Upon arriving, my new client rushed out to greet me. Oh, thank God you're here. I'm at my wit's end. Her arms were crossed and breathing labored. She was clearly out of sorts. Oh, sorry, where are my manners? I'm Jessica. Nice to make your acquaintance. I'm Henry. Jessica was young, maybe mid to late twenties. Dark hair, freckled skin. I probably would have found her attractive if she didn't remind me of my daughter. Please, come in. We walked to the front door and entered the house. After hanging up my hat, I took a look around. It was a lovely home, quaint but spacious. Can I get you some coffee? No, thanks. If it's all the same to you, I'd prefer to get right to work. Do you have the list? She picked up a sheet of paper from the coffee table and handed it to me. There were ten rules in total. How many rules have you broken so far? She looked embarrassed. Seven, all together. That's good, Jessica. I mean, it means there's still time. Still time for what? She asked. Time to end things. I pulled a lighter out of my pocket and held the flame beneath the page. What are you doing? Not many people know this, but burning a list before all the rules are broken summons the demon who wrote it. She glared at me, petrified, a look of absolute fear across her face. Demon? The flame spread to the outer edges of the paper. Yes. These lists are powerful demonic contracts. With every rule you break, you're tempting fate, inviting the demon to absorb your soul. My soul? 
The page had all but burned up now. Yes, they feed off them. With a list like this, the demon has access to your soul. Every misstep is another chance to feed. After all rules are broken, your soul is theirs completely, as per the unwritten terms of the contract. The sheet of paper turned to ash and fell to the floor. Jessica started to ask another question, but I held my hand up to stop her. Wait. It's coming. We watched as a cloud of smoke formed at the center of the living room. It grew until it reached the ceiling and then swirled around faster with each passing second. After a minute or so, it dissipated, revealing the demon within. Hello, Henry. It took the form of a man in the turn-of-the-century attire. Gray hair, gray mustache. Jessica walked over and stood by his side. I see you've met my daughter. Now I'd be lying if I said I wasn't surprised at this revelation. But all signs of foul play were there that I should have picked up on it sooner. No car in the driveway. No family photos on the wall. No signs of a struggle in the house, despite Jessica having broken most of the rules. What is this? The demon laughed. You've made quite the impression downstairs with your heroic shenanigans over the years. I've been tasked with eliminating you. I reached into my coat for a weapon. But the demon gestured for me to stop. Please, Henry, I have another idea in mind. Why don't we make a deal? I scoffed. A deal, huh? What exactly do you have in mind? He smiled. Give me your soul, and I will bring back your daughter. My heart sank. Chelsea was the whole reason I hunted supernatural things in the first place. She died over a decade ago in a house fire. One that I discovered after years of investigation was caused by some unknown entity. I was never the same after that. Instead of grieving in the way most parents do, I made it my life's work to track down her killer. And everything like it. What do you say, Henry? It's a fair trade. I would give anything to see Chelsea, even my soul, but not like this. Demonic resurrections always came with side effects. It was very likely that if Chelsea was brought back, she would succumb to an insatiable bloodthirst, unlike that of the demons themselves. I could never put her through something so terrible. Not a chance. His lips contorted into a wicked grin. I thought you might say that. That's why I had my daughter slip something into your pocket. Confused, I reached into my coat pocket and pulled out a scrap of paper. There were three rules written on it. One, don't enter the house. Two, don't burn the list. And three, accept the demon's deal. Son of a bitch. Without knowing it, I had broken all the rules on the list, giving this demon full access to my soul. All he had to do now was come and take it. Sorry, Henry. You're mine now. Their skin melted away, dripping from their frames like candle wax, revealing the red, connective tissue underneath. Then their eyes turned black and their mouths opened wide, no teeth or tongues within just empty pits of blackness. One kiss would suck the life right out of me. Before I could reach into my coat pocket again, Jessica leapt across the room and pinned me to the wall, forcing her mouth against my face. My soul began to untether itself from me. The sensation was a strange one. There was an immense feeling of pain, but also heartache. The likes of which I had only felt once before. As soul and body separated, something bubbled to the surface. It wasn't so much my life flashing before my eyes as it was a single memory playing out in my mind. I'll be fine, Dad. Stop worrying. I know. It's just that... Chelsea interjected. I'm your little girl. It's your job to worry about me. Am I that predictable? She smiled. Only when it comes to caring about me. I looked around the house. And it saddened me. I was happy for Chelsea, but I couldn't believe how quickly she'd grown up. You know, you can come visit sometime, right? 
It's only a two-hour flight. I can pay for the ticket. Just say the word whenever you feel you want to. Dad, I'm still your daughter. I'll visit when I can. But you have to come to terms with the fact that I'm an adult with a life of my own. Between work and college, I can't always come when you call, okay? I laughed as a tear ran down my cheek. So you're the parent now. Is that it? She laughed. If you don't leave soon, you're going to miss your flight. She was right. I admit, I was cutting it pretty close. I know, I just... I'm, I'm going to miss you, that's all. I miss you too, Dad. I'm only a phone call away. And with that, I left the house and I drove to the airport. Little did I know it then, but that would be the last time I ever saw my little girl alive. I hadn't thought of that day in quite some time. It was locked away deep in my heart for fear of the feelings that it would invoke in me. In this dire moment, my life hanging in the balance, it served as a reminder. A reminder of why I did the things no one else would dare to do. Why I fought to save others and kill things that left evil in their wake. It was all for her. With what strength I had left, I reached into my coat, pulled out a blade, and plunged it into Jessica's side. She backed off and fell to the floor, writhing in pain. Silver! I couldn't kill demons, but it sure as hell slowed him down. Before the man could come to his daughter's aid, I quickly sliced my hand open and used the blood to paint a sigil on the wall. One push at the center and the demons would vanish, cast back into the underworld where they belonged. It was a temporary fix, but I was in no condition to fend them off. Henry, wait! The man called out to me, my hand over the sigil ready to send him packing. Don't you want to know what happened to Chelsea? He was stalling. I could tell, but I had the upper hand, and I could afford to hold off for a moment. It might have been foolish, but I gave in to my curiosity and listened. She screamed when the flames overtook her. Her skin peeled and flaked while she cried. He was lying. He didn't know what happened. And still, I couldn't bring myself to turn away. Even a fabricated story about my daughter was better than no story at all. As morbid as it sounds, it made me feel closer to her. His words offered a setting in which I could fantasize about saving her. Something I often did but struggled to picture. It was an addiction of mine. She was so terrified, she couldn't stop speaking nonsense, counting backwards from ten. I killed her before the fire could, just to shut her up. My blood ran cold. That was something I taught her when she was little. Dad, help! I woke to Chelsea screaming and ran to her bedroom. Sweetie, what's wrong? Her breathing was sporadic. Something certainly had her rattled. It's here! The monster! It was another one of her night terrors. Ever since her mother died, she'd get them at least twice a week. Every time I'd come to the rescue and calm her down. Okay, sweetie. Just a bad dream. You're still sleeping. She wouldn't let up. It's gonna get me! I took her in my arms and I held her. Remember what I taught you. Count backwards from ten. It'll all fade away. She whimpered for a moment and then she began counting. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Her breathing was becoming more even and controlled. Six. Five. Four. Three. She stopped crying and loosened her grip on my arm. Two. One. And just like that, she was awake, free of the nightmares that plagued her. All right, sweetie. You okay now? Go back to sleep. She offered me an innocent smile and crawled back under the covers. I left the door open just a crack, enough so that I could hear her and come running if she needed me. Just like I did every time. He had been telling the truth. He could have never known about that otherwise. 
Well, Henry, I'm the one who killed her all those years ago. She had a list just like yours and broke every rule. I showed up to collect. My heart nearly stopped right then and there. All this time spent chasing monsters, and he was right here, in the same room with me, the thing responsible for taking my little girl's life. Come on, Henry. Don't you want to avenge your daughter? My hand hovered over the sigil. Jessica was still on the floor. It took everything in me not to pull away and lash out. That's just what he wanted. He knew I didn't have the energy needed to kill him, not with my soul tattered. She begged for her life, you know. It was pathetic. I was dangerously close to taking the bait. All I could see was Chelsea's house going up in flames. You were her father. Why didn't you save her, Henry? I needed to calm down otherwise. Otherwise, I'd surely retaliate and be as good as dead. No more hunting, no more lives to save, no killing this demon once and for all. Some father you were, leaving your girl out in the world to die alone. I counted backwards in my head. Ten. Nine. Eight. What's the matter, Henry? Too scared to fight back. It was working. The anger and sadness was still there, but, my, but his voice was fading from the foreground. Seven. Six. Five. I can only imagine what's happening to her soul downstairs. Oh, the humanity. The adrenaline in my veins was slowing. Four. Three. Two. This is your only chance you'll ever have, Henry. It's now or never. One. One. Calmer than I was before. I pushed my hand onto the sigil with as much force as I could muster. No! He cried out. But it was no use. His and Jessica's bodies vanished in a flash of light, leaving behind only an unpleasant burning odor and faint impressions where they were on the carpet. Thank God that's over. I stumbled out to the car and got to the driver's seat feeling a bit better than I had just moments before. Before driving off, I took one last look at the house, feeling a regret similar to when I left Chelsea years before. This isn't over. With that, I took off down the road, wounded, but with some newfound clarity. I knew what I had to do, and no person or thing is going to stop me. That demon's life will be mine, with the information he gave me, there was another matter I had to attend to first. I'm going to save Chelsea's soul. About three years ago, a buddy named Will and I went kayaking and sluice logging. I think a combination of hiking and swimming in the Loxahatchee remnant of the Everglades. I had just gotten engaged to my girlfriend of seven years, and he was celebrating three years of avoiding painkillers and sticking towards weed, <laughs> and that started after our third amigo, Corey Walton, passed away from an overdose. Now, Will had been partially responsible, and fled instead of calling the police to avoid trouble, and uh, he never forgave himself. I had difficulty with it from time to time, so I tried to consider not hating him for it, and considered it a burden to work on, and he agreed to work on his painkiller habit. So we had brought some shrooms and weed with us to really enjoy the wilderness. And our friendship went back more than 15 years, all the way to our high school group of hooligans, so I couldn't just, couldn't just give up on him. My name's Jason Grover. And this is the story of what me and my friend found in the swamp. We paddled out with our old kayaks from Arthur R. Marshall Park in West Palm Beach, Florida. We planned so that we could go camping a few miles in, grill up some fish, enjoy Mother Nature. We decided to go much deeper in than we normally did, but our adventures had become a ritual one since Will started getting clean. We had a variety of GPS devices so that we didn't go missing like, well, so many others. 
After four or five hours, we noticed it was getting dark, and Will suggested that we find a good spot to camp. Hey man, check out this tunnel, Will suggested, pointing at a waterway that went below a thick canopy of trees that formed a tunnel-like structure. There are plenty of invasive species, like Australian pine, climbing fern, and Brazilian pepper in the areas that we passed, but, but we must have gotten pretty deep because I hadn't seen a single invasive species for nearly an hour. There was a skinny woman dressed all in white, standing on a patch of land covered in tall trees, but she wasn't facing us. She walked into the grass when we came near. Hey, lady! Is there good solid ground here? Will tried to ask. But she didn't respond in return. He shrugged. We decided to go through the verdant tunnel ahead of us. Most of the canopies were formed by mangrove, cypress, working together to hoard what passed for solid land and the natural state of Florida. And this one was particularly thick. This one was so thick that it blocked out the sun almost entirely, for about 400 feet, creating a dark tunnel of tropical colors, with only occasional holes for the dark orange and purple sunset to cast light through. There were tons of strange purple bromeliads, beautiful flowers that formed nest-like structures to grow from the crevices of trees and branches so that they would not need soil. Wow. What the fuck do you think brought it down? Will asked. I looked at him in incomprehension until he pointed at a spot in the canopy above us. In addition to the vines and flowers, letters could be seen through a rare area that wasn't covered in foliage. The canopy had been formed by a downed aircraft, and a big one by the looks of it. The Everglades used to enjoy a similar reputation to the Bermuda Triangle, and it wasn't uncommon at all to find old military service planes here and there throughout the wetlands. This particular wreck looked ancient, so it didn't surprise me that we had never heard of it. Well, I pity we don't have any choice in exploring the fuck out of this. It's gonna eat our time. Will equipped happily. Yeah, we pretty much have to, I said, after I'd recovered from my shock. Yeah, I'd say so, he said with a triumphant laugh. Abandoned places is going to absolutely shit its pants. I nodded in awe as we realized that what appeared to be a cockpit lay some distance ahead of us. The severed wing had propped itself up against a particularly hardy pond cypress tree that seemed to partially wrap itself around the metal as if embracing it. We set up camp, putting up our mosquito net over a natural lean-to created by the wing of the downed aircraft, and setting up every insect repellent known to man. On closer inspection, the formerly robust-looking tree that had seen some better days, the words La Cigu were spray-painted near the cockpit of the plane, but the vines obscured anything else. I would have camped elsewhere, but Will wanted to get a mosquito net up quickly and thought it looked cool. It was the winter which made the mosquitoes less of a problem, but not enough of a difference. The swamp could exsanguinate a cow in 30 minutes without enough deet. I couldn't blame him for wanting to get it ready. Once the sun was down, we decided to make a fire and warm up our dinner, consisting of some fish that we had caught. Grapes, spiderwort, swamp cabbage, betony, young cattail stalks, and ringless honey mushrooms, which we'd added together with some lettuce and ground provisions to make a gigantic weird salad, which was quite delicious. In addition, Will decided to rush ahead with some magic mushrooms although not even close to a full dose. Just enough to make the scenery a little weird, I assumed. After some time, we noticed some soft blue lights and the sounds of people talking and laughing in the distance, and figured that we must not be too far from civilization after all. Cool. Maybe our neighbors might like to party, Will suggested. There was a wild peal of a woman's laughter that encouraged us to believe this was at least possible. After enjoying our salads, Will decided that we wanted to explore a bit, Despite it being late, I couldn't blame him. He headed straight for the cockpit of the downed craft. It had broken off from the fuselage and was laying face down in the water, which didn't exactly bode well for the pilots. One of the wings had been thrown several hundred feet ahead. Despite not being able to get the door to the cockpit open, he was able to find something interesting. Dude, how do we not hear about this? He asked in amazement. Probably went down years ago. I mean, the Everglades are full of these wrecks. 
We'd even passed an ancient Cessna that nature hadn't taken nearly as much of a liking to. No, it doesn't look like that's the case, he said, pointing to a laminated piece of paper that had survived the crash intact. At the top of the page was the date, only three months prior to us finding it. The list of passengers showed 19 passengers were originally on the list. What the fuck? I asked in audible amazement. I set up a floodlight on the interior of what was once the craft and immediately saw that despite Mother Nature's ferocity, there were many signs that it had once recently maintained life. Several first aid kits were still in the craft, only two of them open, and only one missing its contents. Some rations had been untouched and still in their packaging. Near the wing, we had not camped until there were signs of a campsite. Near the wing we had not camped under, there were signs of a campsite. After unpacking and preparing our camp, we decided to head out before the sun went down to see as much as possible of the mysterious rag. There was only a single sign of death, a skeleton that we hadn't noticed in one of the darker areas of the fuselage that we had kayaked through. Its arms and legs held it to the wall of the fuselage by vines, allowing the partially shattered torso to sag slightly as if it had been crucified. It looked like it had been picked clean and now had a beautiful bromelade growing from one of its eye sockets, making it look like it had one dark purple and green eye. They still watched us with an amazed expression. There was a hole in the rib cage, and most of the bones around it wrenched forward slightly. If it weren't for the downed aircraft, I would have suspected a gunshot. Holy shit, dude, Will said, with an incredible sense of awe as he snapped the photo after with an incredible sense of awe as he snapped photo after photo. We have to check out the campsite. He was clearly thrilled despite the creepiness. He seemed ecstatic. I hope the trip went well for him. Will took as many pictures as possible, especially the beautiful skeleton. Before we were back in our kayaks and maneuvered to the campsite on the opposite side of the fuselage amidst a group of small grassy islands. It seemed strangely far away from a lot of decent, even partially covered places to sleep. Being out in the open on a small, easily submerged island generally is the worst spot to camp in the Everglades. Well, Will set up a floodlight so that we could see the area better. It had been a while since a fire had been started there, but there was another corpse, and this one was not nearly as picked clean. It was wearing a bright yellow sundress and still had some desiccated flesh sticking to the bones. Most of the skeleton was cured into a fetal position but one of its arms were several feet from where it was, and one of the legs had been shattered. A few feet away from the scene was a now extremely rusty revolver. I guessed and looked around the skeleton, was sure enough, deep in the sand there was a bullet, where someone must have shot this woman in the leg for some reason. What do you think happened? Will asked. And at first it seemed like a stupid question, until I thought about it. There were plenty of rations left in the plane plenty of ways to avoid exposure. She seemed to have a radio. There's no reason for whatever happened here to happen. I grabbed the rusty gun just in case something attacked them. Looks like someone shot her in the leg. Where is everyone else from the crash? Why the fuck wasn't this in the news? I asked aimlessly as Will was more wrapped up in his trip. We checked around the area of land, but I didn't see anything. I was about to suggest leaving, but Will began taking pictures of the wing, specifically the motor on the wing. All right, there might be an award or something for this, Will said with delight. I turned the corner and found what had left him in a good mood. The propeller on the rig was filled to the brim, and I mean all the way, with dead corpses of birds. Most of them were just skeletons and feathers, but the mass of twisted birds looked like a horrible Halloween prop. Yeah... Yeah, we should contact the authorities right away. I mean, just... Just so we look all right. Will was a good guy, but he tended to be extremely focused on his search for personal luxuries. Often to the point of causing problems for himself. I mean, you had to remind him from time to time. He was about to respond when suddenly we heard a loud shriek coming from our campsite. Oh man, I hope this doesn't turn into a bad trip, Will said. I didn't want to make things worse by telling him that we clearly had picked the wrong spot to camp. As we swung our kayaks to head back to our camp, we heard chittering, bizarre laughter. Someone ran through the tall grasses and said something along the lines of, 
I wish we had picked some up the last time we were at the store. And a high-pitched, slightly nasally woman's voice as if a normal conversation. Hey! Hey! Hello! I shouted. Will looked confused. Where did that come from? He asked. Suddenly another voice rang out. No, it was just a telemarketer. Get some rest. Whoever it was had this New York accent was somewhere behind us. But when we looked, there was only some water and grass. I flashed my light in the direction it came from, but saw only shadows moving. I started paddling away from whoever was speaking and towards the camp. Will looked terrified as we headed through the plane again, especially at the skull, which seemed to regard us with that same hostile amusement that it had when we first met it, and was now considerably less cool. Maybe we ought to just get the fuck out of here. Someone here wants to fuck with us. I'm sorry, man. I hope this doesn't fuck up your trip, I said with as much firmness in my voice as I could muster. Yeah, yeah, it's cool, it's cool, Will said. Very obviously to himself, as much to me. He was shaking pretty badly and seemed to be having some difficulty following me. I had to keep him from tripping over repeatedly. When we got to our lean-to camp, it was obvious someone had been through our stuff, and none of it was destroyed. Instead, all of our belongings had been laid out neatly outside of our tent in overlapping circles, like an insane Venn diagram. Most of the vegetation and scrap from the surrounding area had been cleared away. I could now see the spray paint on the side of the aircraft said La Siguapa in a desperate hand. Strange symbols now covered the cockpit as well. La Siguapa? I said aloud. I remembered a friend of mine telling me that it was a mythical demon from the Dominican Republic, but, but he described it like it was some kind of mermaid. Dude, what the fuck? Will said, rushing to our tent to check for further damage. His flashlight lit up hundreds of bizarre symbols that had been painted on the interior of the mosquito net. I understand that the schedule is tight, but that meeting is a priority, came a stern woman's voice from a far distance. Dude, do you think that those are the people who survived the crash? Will asked, not even bothering to speak to whoever it was. For once, he had the right idea, and I hope he stuck to it. I just shook my head. I was shocked that anyone could survive a crash like that, but something was now clearly wrong with those fucking people. I would get them help later once the authorities came. I, I hope that Will wouldn't suggest going to speak with them. Well, where did the bodies go then? He asked quietly. There was a chance that the tail had broken off. Sucking people out. But it was hard to tell. And why had that skeleton been shot in the chest? Will sounded like he was breathing hard enough to hyperventilate. So I had to calm him down before he panicked further and then call the authorities. As if it was going to be easy to help us out there. Dude, where did the bodies go? Why did we not hear about a missing plane? What the fuck is happening here? He was freaking out. He was raising the chances of both of us dying. He took out his cell phone and tried to make a phone call, but stared at his phone oddly for a moment. I can't get any reception to open a browser, and when I tried to make an emergency call, I heard, all I heard was a woman singing in Spanish. He almost cried in despair. Let me get in contact with the authorities. It's okay, dude. Just chill out for a second, okay? Just chill. I took out my own phone and tried to use every emergency system I had in place for the situation. My phone essentially told me to fuck off, even for emergency calls. I found our radio equipment surprisingly undamaged amongst the bizarre circle. Will smoked a joint the size of his forearm, which was a relief to see, considering his own situation. When I finally got a line of communication up, all I heard was a woman's voice, singing in this strange-sounding song, in a language I didn't recognize. I speak Spanish fluently, and whatever I was listening to had nothing to do with the language. It didn't even sound like a... A romance language. Every channel, every channel that should have been used seemed to play it endlessly. I tried not to mention anything, but Will probably noticed the look of frustration and began talking more rapidly for it. Hey, dude, maybe we should ask those people for help. There's some more over there. He pointed in the distance ahead of us, and I noticed some lights blossoming some ways away. A cold chill went up my spine, and I remembered the nonsense phrases that were uttered in response to us asking for help the gun near the woman. They didn't seem very helpful. I'm gonna set up a PLB first. A personal locator beacon, or PLB, was something that you wanted if you were going into the wild. His only job was to send out a powerful SOS that was difficult for search and rescue teams to miss. Then I fired up our satellite messenger, which should have allowed me to have access to Facebook and Twitter. Except this time, nothing loaded correctly. I turned the signal off, then on again. And it came out worse. Every single thing I read was in some weird language. It was bizarre symbols, spelled out in otherwise blank web pages. I couldn't even use it to send out an SOS. 
so I kept the PLB in my pocket. Get anyone? Will asked with obvious fear in his voice. Getting him to calm down was difficult enough when he wasn't on shrooms. The SOS beacon is working. Okay, just give it some time, dude. It's cool. We may end up camping out here while we wait. I hoped he would listen to what I had said for once. Because if he lost his shit, we could end up in trouble out here. Death was not something I wanted to think about, but it was absolutely a possibility, especially with Will not being helpful. I was happy he was smoking weed, I mean, just to keep him out of the way. He must have loved it too, because nearly an hour went by before I heard from him again. Dude. Look. He said. Barely above a whisper. At the very far edge of the clearing. More than 600 feet away from us. The woman we had seen earlier was standing quietly. Just like before, she was standing with her back to us moving around as if she was working on something that we couldn't see. Her white blouse and khaki shorts hung from her body as she was utterly emaciated. Both of her hands and her legs were jet black with what looked like incredible bruising. A long river of black hair flowed to the ground. She was muttering strange phrases mixed with strange songs that I had heard on my phone. and I quietly tried to turn off my lights and warn Will but it was too late. Hey lady, do you need some help? Will asked, shining his flashlight on her before I could even motion for him to shut the actual fuck up. A long horrendous shriek emerged from the woman as she began to run at us at an incredible speed while still backwards. Without thinking twice, I took the gun out of my pocket, hit the safety and pulled the trigger in its general direction. But if I hit it, it didn't seem to do anything. Instead, I couldn't hear anything and the fucking thing flew out of my hand. Will took a moment staring in shock, but eventually followed my cue of running to the kayaks. Before I did, I noticed the woman's feet and knees seemed to move in a way that implied they were facing us. Shit, 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 shit. I, I couldn't hear the words coming out of my mouth. The ringing in my ears covered everything up. Will was shouting something to me I couldn't make out as he pushed his kayak out with him laying on top of it instead of in it. I struggled to use my paddle to push myself as far away from the land as possible and almost landed in the water in the process but managed to keep my ship right. And then I looked back and I noticed small pale hands sticking out of the water in front of where Will was moving his kayak and I knew, I knew they were going to catch the small craft. I slowed down and reversed just slightly allowing him to slide onto the top of my kayak right as two pale bodies shot from the water, hair covering their faces and grabbed it. It was amazing mine didn't simply go under. Will was screaming something, and I paddled as hard as I could as Will cut loose any weight that he could find, including the only supplies that we had that weren't on the island. He managed to make it to the aircraft. When I looked back, the woman was still standing there, as, as well as two others, a man and a, a younger-looking girl. All had their backs facing the kayak that they were tearing apart, matted hair covering their faces. I paddled us through the aircraft. I saw that the strange flower growing from the skeleton was now glowing with a powerful blue light, just like the ones we had seen in the distance. Will and I stared in awe and horror as we realized what had become of the survivors. I wondered if perhaps the flower was the real culprit. I mean, it wasn't unheard of for some parasites to force their prey to perform labor. Perhaps, perhaps this was a similar mechanism. We paddled for at least a half an hour, only to find ourselves returning to the aircraft again. This time, a man stood just off to the side, not facing away from us, wearing absurdly baggy clothes. We kept quiet. We left. We kept coming back. Again and again. Another one eventually appeared on the edge of the aircraft, a child by the looks of it, who stood up as we neared and we left quietly every time. Without our GPS units, our chances of finding a way out were seemingly non-existent. And with Will laying on top of my craft, if, if one of those things chased us again, we would probably be joining them or getting eaten or who knows what. Will began to sob uncontrollably as we realized we had gone in a circle for the fourth or fifth time. I was, I was fucking exhausted. There were more of those things, those people, every time we came near. Well, we have to go back. You can see shock and horror across his face. No, no, man, I don't. 
Let's just keep trying. I could barely hear his words over the ringing in my ears. If we don't get our GPS map, we're never going to be able to figure out how to leave. Something's fucking with us. It's keeping us here. We need that thing, I said, knowing that sternness had crept into my voice. I could see his lips forming the words no over and over again, and it pissed me off. Do you want to die out here, Will? Because they'll be happy to help. Let's just do this. Let's get it done with. He seemed to quiet down after that. I padded in silence for another 15 minutes before we reached the edge of the aircraft again. Okay. Okay, we're going to do this as quickly as possible, I told him. And he simply nodded in terror. We didn't see any more of them around the exterior of the aircraft. I paddled through the green tunnel until we came to the edge of the clearing where our belongings had been left. Will's kayak was ripped to shreds on the edge of the water. No creepy backwards people, though. We landed as quietly as possible, and Will slid off the kayak, allowing me to get free. Our stuff was in circles again, but this time, different circles. I looked through the one closest to us and found some batteries, but nothing else useful. Will poked around, but didn't seem very focused. Instead, he was watching the woods around us as he half ambled over to the wing where we had built our camp under. Hopefully, he was looking for supplies and not weed. We went back to searching and eventually found a radio and the GPS system. I put in the batteries and it kicked to life. Albeit in a strange language, the map was still visible. I also grabbed the gun, which, although it had fallen, hadn't gone far. Thank God La Siguapa didn't care for them. From every direction, that song was now following us slowly, steadily, getting closer. I stared in horror as the first one, then two, and at least... Half a dozen emaciated bodies came from the woods. Each had blackened arms and legs turned all the way around, and there were two that were very close to the kayak, and the gun didn't have many bullets left. Before I could think about it, I shot the tree that was holding up the airplane wing. The wing came down with a sickening crack and a tremor, landing on top of Will. He screamed a long, impossible scream, and even from the distance, one of our floodlights illuminated dark pink foam that had started to flow from his mouth. I backed away from my friend as he flailed pitifully against the structure, which had surely crushed his ribcage. I got better. Please help me. I got better. Will screamed and gurgled. The backwards people came rushing to him. And at first it looked like they were going to help, but then, then the screaming intensified. As they ran to him, I could see their faces frozen in fearful grimaces, their eyes no longer seeing, their limbs blackened and turned around. They flocked to Will and seemed to be tearing the flesh off of his bones in strips. And I ran to the now undefended kayak. I'm sorry, I screamed as I fled. But the only response was the singing growing louder. I managed to get out of there, and, and I got home the next morning. By then, park rangers were out in the exterior area, but they didn't seem to be searching for anyone. They drew their weapons at me when they saw me, but they lowered them after a tense moment or two of me begging for my life. They sunk my kayak, and they told me not to mention any of what happened to anyone. I mentioned Will, but they just shrugged. They said... They said he's gone now. They had me fill out paperwork saying that he drowned on accident and that there wasn't going to be any investigation. He told me to never come back. And I plan on keeping that promise. And you, you should probably avoid the Everglades too. I have a surprise for you, Jimbo. My father, the inventor in plaid, stood in the middle of the living room with a blocky object hidden beneath a bedsheet. It was the spring of 1981. My mother and I had just come back from the park. What is it? Guess. His hands tightened over the cloth. Whatever the surprise was, he was excited to reveal it. A gentle whirr and a beep came from beneath the bedsheet. A skeptical smile spread across my mother's face. Brian, you didn't build a... Ah, don't spoil it! He cut her off. Let him guess. 
Come on, Jimbo. What do you think the surprise is? The mysterious object let out a series of beeps. Weight shifted beneath the bedsheets. I didn't have the faintest idea of what it could be, but I also knew my father well enough to know he wouldn't move unless I made a guess. A watching machine? I guessed. They both laughed. Over the following years, my guests would be carved into family history through funny dinner party anecdotes. It's not a washing machine, Jimbo, my father finally said. It's something much better than a washing machine. You didn't actually build it, did you? My mother asked in amused disbelief. Hun, if you didn't want a husband who builds things, you shouldn't have married an inventor, he said with pride in his voice, and then turned to me. Jimbo, let me introduce you to your new friend... Zorbo! He ripped off the cloth covering the bulky thing in our living room. A pair of flashlight eyes stared back at me from a rectangular metal skull. Knobs and dials stuck out of the robot's stainless steel chest like metals from some intergalactic war. Its arms hung on tubing that seemed to have come straight from a vacuum cleaner, but its hands were made of sleek shapes that suggested top-secret military technology. Hello, friend. I am Zorbo. The robot said, its voice strained through lifeless circuitry. Would you like to play catch with me? I was an only child, and by extension, a lonely child. For years, I had begged my parents for a younger brother or sister. But that medication that my mother was taking made the idea of another pregnancy far too dangerous. That winter, I shifted my pleas of company over to a puppy, and... My parents obliged, but within three hours of finding my new friend beneath the Christmas tree, I ended up in the emergency room. Turns out, I was deathly allergic to dogs. With his son unable to find companionship, my father attempted to help the only way he knew how. By inventing me a friend. The heap of sentient metal terrified me. There was something about the sluggish way that Zorbo's eyes scanned the room that made me feel essentially unsafe. But I knew that if I rejected my father's gift, I would break the man's heart. After the initial fear of the robot passed, our little family went outside and played catch with Zorbo. Soon enough, word about Zorbo got around to the neighborhood. You could have made an 80s sitcom about us. We were the family living in suburbia with a zany robot. Except Zorbo wasn't very zany. At first, he was the equivalent of a particularly friendly Roomba who could throw around a baseball. But as time went on, and as my mother got sicker, Zorbo's skill set expanded. Every night, as I lay awake, terrified of the lifeless machine that lived with us, I could see the lights of my father's workshop burning in the darkness of our backyard. Within months, Zorbo could cook and clean, and mow the lawn. Every chore that the robot was able to do gave my mother more time to rest and gave my father and me more time to spend with her. But that time was limited. As she lay on that hospital bed, getting out the few final words that her disease-riddled body could muster, Zorba was there. As me and my father wept and assured my mother that she lived a truly beautiful life, the robot stood in the corner of the room his flashlight eyes scanning his surroundings. He listened to her last words. He internalized them deep into his circuitry. For a year, the house was a place of inescapable sadness. Every room, every dish, every tiny bit of existence reminded us of the woman who was whisked away by a clump of rogue cells. Even though we were in a state of deep mourning, the house was immaculate, and our stomachs were full. As we tried to make sense of the new world that we were living in, Zorbo the robot was there to take care of us. The memory of my mother never faded. Decades later, a day seldom goes by when I don't think of her. But as time passed, the daily soul-shattering sadness turned into quiet melancholy. Life carried on. My father went back to work for the military, I started grade school, people moved in and out of the neighborhood and eventually, the life we once lived as a family became a memory. The only thing that remained constant was Zorbo. He was always there, making sure that we were comfortable, serving us and providing an emotional crutch that we needed. 
That all changed in the summer of 1989. The summer of a lawnmower. Cindy, the daughter of the new neighbor across the street, was sitting with me at the living room table, outlining a five-paragraph essay on the effects of the 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia. I was trying to do the same, but my hormone-addled mind refused to think about Soviet tanks or the crushing of democracy. All I could think about was... Cindy. It was the last week of school, and I was hopelessly in love. Hey, how do you spell... Brezhnev? All these Soviet names kind of give me a headache, she asked, leaning over to my near-empty paper. I tried to spell out the name, but the angelic smell of her conditioner made it difficult to concentrate. Zorbo? I finally said, giving up on impressing Cindy with my spelling skills. How do you spell Brezhnev? Thank you for asking, friend. The robot's flashlight eyes spun around in a half circle before he gave his reply. Leonid Brezhnev, leader of the Soviet Union between 1964 and 1982. L-E-O-N-I-D. B-R-E-Z-H-N-E-V. Thank you, Zorbo, Cindy said. You are welcome, friend, Zorbo replied. Would you like more spelling help? No, thank you, Zorbo, I mumbled. Cindy thought the robot was really neat. And even though my metal house guest still made me uncomfortable, I was starting to embrace the benefits of having a sentient machine full of knowledge whirring around the house. Don't talk too much about the Soviets with Zorbo, kids. Things might get personal, my father said, emerging from the kitchen with a sandwich so precisely cut that it could only come from a machine. He's part Russian. I mean, most of his circuitry is Japanese, but our metal friend here might still get a bit offended if you don't toe the Kremlin per political line. Cindy laughed and was like a symphony of angels, enjoying a wholesome joke. I'll be sure to keep the Politburo in mind when talking to Zorbo, Mr. Karpek, she said. Politburo, eh? My father was impressed. Smart one right here, Jimbo. Hold on to her. She could teach you a thing or two. I wanted to hold on to her. Oh god, how I wanted to hold on to her. I wanted to surrender myself to the teen goddess and scream my undying love for Cindy through my crackling vocal cords. But instead, I just blushed. My father stifled a grin and changed the topic. By the way, Cindy, send your pops my regards about the new lawnmower. Beauty of a machine he's got there. If we didn't have Zorbo here cutting the grass, I'd be hounding him for the name of the salesman. My father gave Zorbo a friendly pat on the tubular arm and then turned to me. Seen the neighbor's lawnmower yet, Jimbo? I shook my head. He's a beaut. He kissed the tip of his fingers like an Italian chef on TV. Mwah! Essay's just about done. Thanks for the spelling help, Zorbo. You are welcome, friend. I left my unfinished essay behind and followed Cindy to the edge of my front lawn. I had hoped that at some point during the 30-second walk, a burst of bravery would manifest in my chest and I would tell her how I felt. But it didn't. It never did. I just stood behind our white picket fence watching my one true love skip across the street. Hey, Jim! Cindy's dad yelled as he mowed his lawn. Say hi to your old man for me, will you? Sure thing, Mr. Clark, I yelled back. Also, my dad sends his compliments about your lawnmower. Mr. Clark's old machine was a rustling, gas-guzzling beast. Whenever his lawn was getting a trim, the entire neighborhood would be alerted to the groundskeeping with a jagged, metallic screech. But that was no longer the case. The new lawnmower was a tool of sleek metallic shapes and blinking lights that let out nothing but a soft hum as it cut through the grass. Thanks, Jim. She's a beaut, ain't she? Cindy's dad said before returning to the mowing. I never inherited the fascination with the machines that my father had, but watching that machine work away at the greenery, I couldn't help but recognize a hint of hypnotizing aesthetic. Looking at the calculated metallic body of the machine made me feel like I was living in the 21st century. The future had arrived in suburbia. Hello, friend, an inhuman voice next to me said. What is that? That's a uh, lawnmower, I replied, uncomfortable at the idea of how quietly Zorbo could move when he wanted to. Lawn mower, Zorbo said, with an unusual softness in his jagged speech. Beautiful. Lawn 
Oh, where? My father seldom cooked, but when he did, he would deliver a symphony of spices that would make you eat yourself into a food coma. Even Zorba, with all of his circuitry and mechanical precision, couldn't replicate the mouth-watering flavor of my father's bolognese. Yet, as delicious as dinner was that night, I couldn't bring myself to enjoy the spaghetti. Instead of letting my mind drift away on the gentle notes of paprika, I was tied down to reality by my frustrated teenage heart. So, he said, is Cindy seeing someone? No, I replied. I don't think so, at least. He swallowed another forkful of pasta, and then, with his mouth still full, as if it was a matter of no importance, he asked the question that had been festering in the back of my head for the past three months. You gonna ask her out? The butterflies in my stomach informed me that I wouldn't be eating any more for that night. I don't know, I said. I'm scared she'll say no. Oh, it doesn't matter, Jimbo. You're 14, my father told me. If she says no, you just won't remember in a couple of years. What you will remember forever is not asking. I was a teen. My perception of time barely reached past the end of summer break. Yet for a split second, I imagined myself at 40, my hairline thinning like my dad's eating spaghetti with a child of my own. But I'm nervous. What if she says no? I finally asked. You'll survive, he said. I was nervous when I first asked out your mom, and it worked out fine. He smiled as he said it. But as soon as he mentioned her, his eyes dimmed. It had been years since she had passed, but certain memories stay as sharp as the day that they were forged. We were sitting in the living room, eating spicy spaghetti. Really, we were both back in that hospital room sitting by the frail body of the woman who once made my father nervous. Hey, where's Zorbo? He brought the conversation back to reality. Zorbo, where are you? At dinner time, Zorbo would usually be in the kitchen, quietly worrying to himself, waiting for dishes to wash up. But that night, the robot wasn't anywhere to be found. We searched all across the house, but our electronic servant was gone. It wasn't until a chance glance out of the window that I saw him. The moon softly reflected off his metallic body. His flashlight eyes hovered beams of red into the night. Zorbo was staring at Cindy's house. Beautiful lawn mower. His voice was different. It was as if a roughness had been chipped away, as if somewhere within his wiry viscera... A hint of emotion existed. Beautiful lawn mower. There was a trace of longing in his voice. Huh, my father said. Looked like someone's blown a fuse. Come here, Zorbo. We'll take you into the garage, figure out what's up. But the robot refused to budge. It wasn't until my father pulled his tube arm around towards the workshop that Zorbo relented and started to move. But even as Zorbo's blinking body moved away from the street, his head remained turned. Those flashlights, to which he took in the outside world, were aimed straight at Cindy's house. Love is the only thing that matters, Zerbo said. My father froze. That gentle note of humanity in Zerbo's voice sent a bolt of discomfort through my spine. We recognized those words. Beautiful lawnmower, Zerbo said again his artificiality returning. My father's face slowly regained its smile. Beautiful lawnmower indeed, buddy. Let's get your circuitry checked out. There was enough pain medication in her to tear away most of her personality. But somewhere in that bony woman, there was a semblance of my mother. We sat with her for the last two days of her life, trying to say all the things we would regret not saying and assuring her of what a beautiful life she had lived. Whenever she would sleep, I would go make my acquaintance with the soda machine and stroll around the hospital, looking for people who had it worse than me. My father talked extensively to whoever would listen about the machines that his wife was hooked up to. Zorbo stood still in the back of the room. 
He never moved an inch until the hour when she died. It was as if... As if he could tell that the life was seeping out of her. As if the machines that were keeping her alive had told him that she was moving on. As if... As we listened to my mother's final attempts at speaking, Zorbo slid in behind us. We stood vigil as a family. Love is the only thing that matters, she said. Zorbo softly whirred next to us as she died. That night I sat with the memories and I tried to make sense of everything. I saw my mom again. I felt that heat in my chest when I thought about Cindy. I could imagine myself as a regretful, balding 40-year-old. Love is all that matters. Outside, my father tinkered away in the garage, trying to wipe Zorbo's circuits of the notion of love, but, but in my bedroom, a fire of teenage passion was burning. I fell asleep trying to compose a monologue that would make Cindy swoon. Hey, were we meant to write a summary of the chapter, or just until page 48? She asked. I had no idea what she was talking about. All I knew was that we were sitting in our living room, and I was about to tell her, I really like you. I blurted out. Like, as, as, a, as a person, Cindy, I think you're pretty cool. B but also, like I like you as, like, a romantic partner. Like I, I think you're, I like, I think you're cute, and I, th I think about you all the time. I like you. I'm sorry. It came out of me like a rushing waterfall, but my face felt like it was the surface of the sun. Her confused look turned up the heat. Uh, her eyes kept on fluttering. For a split second, she looked like Zorbo. If you ever asked him what time it was, I um. I'm sorry, too, because, um, I like you as a friend, but, yeah, no. I stared down at my textbook. Leonid Bresnov was glaring up at me from the page. I should go, she whispered. I'll walk you out, I said, immediately biting into my cheek. The walk to the edge of my yard couldn't have taken longer than 30 seconds, but as we quietly made our way out of the house, I aged a decade. My mind was wholly consumed by the sting of rejection, the tragedy of it, the unfairness of it. I was a little boy getting an allergic reaction to a Christmas puppy again, but this time, instead of a rash on my skin, there was a rash on my heart. I walked past Zorbo without looking at him. From the whirring of his hand blades, I presumed that he was just mowing the lawn. She didn't say anything. Cindy just walked across the street, past her front door without a single glance. Sure, she apologized a week later. Then a couple of months down the line, I was awestruck with someone else. In that searing moment, my world was on fire. Beautiful lawnmower, Zorbo said. Soil clung to his metallic body. The blades that extended from his hands tore into the ground, shooting bits of earth sprawling across the sidewalk. He stared across the street with that same longing I had in my soul. Love is the only thing that matters. Yeah, I said, as I shuffled off to my room to mope. My father found Zorbo shortly before the sunset. He walked out, calling to the robot about the dirty dishes, the ones that had gathered in the sink. But as soon as my father saw his creation digging into the ground, his tone changed. He spoke to him in calm, soothing words. The robot had been working like precise clockwork since the day that he was constructed. My father was worried to see his creation descend into glitchful madness. I knew I should have told him as soon as I found the malfunctioning robot. But there was more pressing things on my mind. As my father rolled Zorbo into his workshop, my love for Cindy consumed me. The life we could have had if I had just waited. If I had phrased my confession of love differently. Snapshots of an alternate reality burned in my mind like an angry film reel. The visions in my head grew sharper. 
I didn't just get rejected by some teenage girl, I got rejected by my future wife. Images of me proposing, of us having our first child, of me sitting by her hospital bed as she died of old age. They squirmed through my mind, accompanied by a booming replay of the couple dozen words with which I wiped them from the future. I was 100% sure I had reached my first lifelong regret. I writhed with mental discomfort until I couldn't be alone. The lights were on in my father's workshop. Dad? I asked, standing by the door. Oh, hey, hey Jimbo! Sorry, gonna skip dinner tonight. Think there sh should still be some bolognese in the fridge, though, he said, not looking away from his work. My father's workshop was always a mess of electronics and scattered tools, but that night, all other projects were cleared away to make room for Zorbo. Our robotic family member lay on a wooden table, his sleek metal skin removed, revealing a chaotic mess of wires and computer chips. Was Zorbo acting different when you came back from school? He asked while digging out a stack of microchips from behind the robot's eyes with a screwdriver. Yeah, he, um... He was digging a hole in the front yard. Well, all right, well... My father buried the frustration in his voice with a sigh. Next time you see him doing something weird, please tell me, all right, Jim? Zorbo's inner workings are very fragile. If something's wrong, it needs to be fixed. I don't want to lose him to some loose wiring. Sorry, Dad. He mumbled something and went back to tinkering with the robot's skull. I was going to leave him to his work, but the sadness in my chest was far too potent for me to be alone. I knew I needed to talk to someone. So I, uh... I asked Cindy out. As soon as the words left my mouth, his hand stopped moving. I didn't have to say anything. As soon as he turned around, he could tell. Before I knew it, I was wrapped up in a bear hug with my eyes growing wet. It's gonna be okay, Jimbo. There'll be plenty of others. Proud of you. Proud of me? Of course. Put yourself out there, and that's the most important Love thing. is the only thing that matters. Wires were hanging off of his raw body. His flashlight eyes spun around the room, searching for an exit. Zorbo was getting off the table and moving towards the door. Beautiful lawnmower, he gobbled through a partially dismantled voice box. Zorbo? My father let go of me and walked up to the staggering mass of electronics. Where are you going, Zorbo? Love is the only thing that matters, Zorbo said, shuffling his way past my father. Beautiful lawnmower. Nah, nah, Zorbo, my father said, grabbing Zorbo's arm slightly above the mud-caked blades. I think you need to lie down for a bit. There's something wrong with you and- Beautiful lawnmower. Zorbo boomed as he ripped free of my father's grip. Love is the only thing that matters. He continued walking out of the garage, each step filled with crackling defiance. Zorbo, you stop right this instant, my father yelled in a tone that was only familiar to me from early childhood. If you keep behaving like this, I will shut you off. The robot's body froze mid-step. He didn't turn around. But his head did. You want to stop Zorba from love? My father gently pushed me aside, placing me away from the disobedient robot. Zorbo, he said, his voice growing cold, come back here and lie down on the table. The beams of light focused on my father. The wiring on Zorbo's body twisted and turned until they were face to face. The blades on his hand started to spin. Do you want to stop Zorbo from love? His voice was lower in volume. He was almost drowned out by the sharp whirring of the mud-covered knives. Goodbye, friend. Zorbo's tubular arm came down like a karate chop on my father's shoulder. Hot blood spattered all over my face. Pain screams filled my ears. The blade cut through my father's skin like butter. I could hear the cracking of bones breaking. Through my father's throat-tearing agony, I could hear a single word come through. RUN! He wanted his only child to get away from the manic robot that was sawing at his arm. He wanted me to survive. But I couldn't move an inch. I just stood there pressed up against the tool cabinet, watching my father be murdered by a robot. I could see myself running across the street to Cindy's house. I could see myself trying to explain to a police officer that an unhinged robot killed my father. I could see myself standing at my father's funeral, watching the dirt over his casket solidify. My status 
as an orphan. But I would never actually see my father's funeral. Instead, I felt the cold steel of a monkey wrench in my hand. I summoned a battle cry from the depths of my lungs. If I let my father die at the hands of a robot, I would regret it for the rest of my life. The adrenaline coursed through my veins and gave reality a jagged edge. Everything moved with breakneck speed, but each time that the blunt object made contact with Zorbo's wiry brain, time dissolved into a short-lived eternity. Zorbo's intricately woven mind was reduced into a mess of cables. Soon enough, my wrench made contact with the floor of the garage. Zorbo was dead. Everything after that is a blur. I remember stumbling out into the street covered in blood, barely able to muster up more strength to yell for help. I remember Mr. Clark holding down a torn shirt over the geyser of blood that was streaming out of my father's shoulder. I remember sitting in the back of an ambulance watching my father linger on the edge of life. For two days I survived on a diet of pop and chocolate from a familiar vending machine. He lost a lot of blood. Even at 14, I could sense that the doctors were preparing me for the worst. But miraculously, on the third day, I was allowed to see my dad. He was weak, desperately weak, but he was alive. All it cost him was his arm. He spent the entire summer in a state of exhausted shock from his creation turning on him, but by the time the fall leaves filled our yard, he was outside with a rake. Cracking jokes. By Christmas, he had a brand new metallic arm courtesy of his workbench. By New Year's, he was washing dishes. Mr. Clark was more than happy to give him the number of the lawnmower salesman. Life carries on. I graduated high school, moved out of state for university, and then continued moving every couple of years, depending on where my job took me. I had my fair share of rejection and breakups, but no heartache ever reached the mythological proportion of the rejection of 89. With all that said and done, my father was right. Knowing that I asked and got shot down was considerably easier to living with having to wonder what could have been. I grew into an adult, and my father shrunk into an old man. He continued to do work with the army well into old age, but as time went on, he was phased out by younger minds that were more in touch with modern tech. In retirement, my father continued to tinker with electronics and build himself contraptions to help him with tasks that old age made difficult. But eventually, as tremors set into his human hand and age chipped away at his human brain, he stopped coming into his workshop. I found myself thinking about his funeral again. But this time it wasn't just a panic snapshot forced into my head by a frenzied robot servant. This time I knew that somewhere down the line I would be standing in a church trying to summarize what the man meant to me in a speech to his old co-workers and, and the family I hadn't seen in years. I never did. I never saw my father's funeral. The fact that I belong to a whole generation of people who are robbed of a funeral makes the pain sting less. There were plenty of other children of the 80s who lost their parents during the pandemic of 2020 who didn't have weekly Skype calls with their father, who had unresolved issues, who had fallen out of touch. But knowing that I'm not the only one who lost a parent during the corona outbreak, it only lessened the pain slightly. The thought of him dying alone, feverish, connected to a respirator he he could have built in his workshop, still cuts into my heart with fiery force. By the time I was able to travel back to my hometown, the house had been empty for months. I walked through the rooms and I wept as the memories washed over me, even though I was filled with sorrow. There was a catharsis to it all. The two people who brought me into the world were gone, but they gave me the tools to survive in it. They shaped the person who mourned them. Each room was filled with evidence that I was loved, and I have it on good authority that love is important. But my father's workshop was different. When I turned on the light, I wasn't reminded of the afternoon I spent keeping my father company while he worked on his projects, or of all the toys that my father built 
when I was a kid. No, there was... There was no memories at all. All I could focus on was the object hidden beneath a bedsheet in the center of the room. A part of me wanted to turn around and leave whatever my father's final project was a mystery, but I knew... I knew myself well enough to know that the question of what was hidden beneath the bedsheet would steal sleep away from me forever. I gripped my hand around the cloth, and I pulled. It was the same lawnmower that Mr. Clark had back in the 80s. Its over-the-top impression of the future seemed nearly comical by modern standards, but there was something attached to its sleek, metallic frame that chilled me to my middle-aged core. Two red flashlights focused on me. Love is the most important thing. Zorbo's voice box whispered out of the core of the machine. Beautiful lawnmower. It hasn't even been a day since I first laid eyes upon it. I was dropping my girlfriend off for her last in-person yoga class before everything went back on lockdown for the winter. When a portrait hanging in the display window of the shop across the street unexpectedly caught my attention. It was an 18-inch by 24-inch expressionist painting of a black humanoid creature with poorly defined edges and features, like it was bleeding into the shadows around it. It was tall, gaunt, and hunched, dressed in a tattered hood and mantle that vaguely resembled a set of wings. It lacked all facial features save for a pair of misty white eyes, the only part of its body that wasn't black. It held a lumpy sack in one hand, and in the other, it plucked up a child between two of its long, Dr. Seuss-esque fingers. The child was bruised and bloodied, and undeniably terrified for its life. But no motive could be inferred from the stance of its tormentor. The whole scene was reminiscent of Saturn devouring his children, only with Saturn reimagined as some sort of Lovecraftian boogeyman. My interest sufficiently piqued, I decided to go inside for a closer look. The shop in question was Orville's old-fashioned oddity outlet, and was mildly infamous for selling strange items of questionable authenticity. Ever since I had started taking my girlfriend to the neighboring Eve's Eden of Esoteria, I often found myself wondering how old Orville managed to stay in business. His oddity shop rarely seemed busy, and from what I could tell, most people agreed that his merchandise was overpriced hokum. It could have been that Orville was living off an inheritance or something, and was operating his business at a loss for the hell of it, or that the runoff from Eves was enough to keep him afloat. But a quick glance at the local paranormal forum, HorwickHollows.net, produced photographs of some of the town's wealthiest residents visiting the shop along with a handful of other mysterious figures who nobody recognized. Everything from cloaked cultists to colorful clown girls had been seen making after-hours visits to Orville's. So maybe, just maybe, a few of Orville's high-end items were legit, and the occasional sale to his select clientele was all he needed to stay in business. It was a fun little thought as I stepped through the door, paying no heed to the large caveat emptor emblazoned upon it. VHS tapes? What am I supposed to do with VHS tapes? I heard a gruff voice ask. I looked towards it and saw an old man in a garish, pastel suit with his feet up on his desk and a phone in his hand. With his other hand, he indicated that he would be with me in a moment. Nobody has a VCR anymore. You have a VCR to go with the tape collection? What's its deal? Of course, you can't set the clock. There's nothing paranormal about that. Listen, what are you trying to sell? The tapes or what's on the tapes? Because if it's what's on the tapes, then maybe you could... Uh-huh. Well, I'll never be able to move them as a general item. I have to convince people to buy an obsolete VCR to go with them. Might be able to broker a deal with a specific buyer. I I'd need more information. No. Not now, though. Well, I got a customer. I'll, I'll call you back. No, I, sa I said... I, I said... No. If you, if you put a piece of scotch tape over the removed tab, you could tape over it again. If there's, if there's tape residue, then you could... You could have taped it over, but it... Well, it could have just been from an old label. How would I know? Yeah. 
Yeah, you figure that out. I gotta go. Okay, bye. He hung up the receiver on the cradle of a bronzed and mahogany rotary phone before folding his fingers and giving me his full attention. Honestly, things some of these jerks try to unload on me, he said with a roll of his eyes. Anywho, can I help you find anything, young man? Uh, yeah, actually. I was wondering about that painting in the window, I replied, pointing to the display behind me. Oh, that's a self-portrait of rancorous Ruck. The old man flashed me a devious smile before donning an iridescent tragedy mask with a surgical mask fixed to the inside. Self-portrait? I asked skeptically. Absolutely, he said, rising from his seat and leading me towards the painting. Cryptids and monsters are notoriously difficult to get decent photographs of, and that was a bit of a problem for old Rancor here. Well, he can't exist in the real world unless he already exists in the mind of a uh, suitable host, let's say. Uh, he's sustained by thoughts about him. He uses his host's innate mental energy to manifest a uh, physical form for himself. This this presents a bit of a catch-22 since he needs people to know about him to exist. But existing is kind of a prerequisite for people to know about you. <laughs> What's a damn thought form to do? Well, if you're a thought-based murder monster like Rancorous Ruck here, you leave a self-portrait behind as a calling card. And that way, even after your host is pushing up daisies, another one's bound to come along sooner or later and end up getting you stuck in their head. He took the portrait down from the easel and allowed me to get a better look at it, taking care not to look at it himself. The first thing I noticed was the lumps of the sack were much more clearly hands or feet or faces pushing through it from the inside. The bottom of the sack was wet and dripping with the dark red fluid, presumably blood, and the background showed many small sets of footprints running rapidly in all directions. Finally, in the corner, I could make the signature of the artist in the same stark white as the creature's eyes. Rancorous Ruck. Self-Portrait. September 1947. So you're claiming that the creature in the portrait is the artist, and it leaves these paintings behind as a way to infect other victims? I asked incredulously. That's right. And anyone with a lick of sense or concern for their fellow human beings burns them. So they're very rare, Orville replied. Now I know what you're thinking. Why in the world would anyone pay $1,300 for a cursed painting? $1,300? No, before taxes, various fees, surcharges, yes. Now the reason is that since old Rancor sustained by your thoughts, you're able to exert some control over how he manifests. The more you study the portrait, the more rancorous you take into yourself. And, if you're strong enough, the more of him you can bend to your will. Potentially very useful. Or, you know, life-saving if he decides to come after you. Which he probably will, since you've taken such an interest in his handiwork. Good luck getting him out of your head now. Seriously, though, your best bet is buying the painting, studying every square inch of it until your eyes are bloodshot, put in some eye drops, and keep studying. I was more than a little confused by Orville's sales pitch of buy this possessed painting in the hopes of inoculating yourself against the demon. I didn't really believe him. But I did find the story mildly entertaining. As for the painting itself, I genuinely liked it. It was delightfully macabre, and I was curious about why the artist would have titled it a self-portrait. I could tell that it was an actual painting and not a print, so even though I would have liked some actual provenance on the piece, 1300 wasn't an outrageous asking price for a decent work by an unknown artist. As much as I hated myself for it, I ended up buying the damn thing, which came to almost 1600 with all of Orville's taxes, fees, and surcharges. He wrapped it up very carefully, still taking the greatest of care not to look at it himself, and helped me Tetris it into the trunk of my car. I didn't want my girlfriend to see it, not because I was afraid of the curse, but because I was afraid of her cursing me out. Fortunately, when she came out of Eve's, she put her bags in the back seat instead of the trunk. I didn't really have a plan for what I would have said if she had opened the trunk, but I got lucky. That was a fight we could save for another day. Once I had taken her home and gotten back to my own apartment, for some reason I took Orville's advice and carefully inspected the painting before hanging it up. It didn't make any sense though, since there wasn't really anything to study. Rancorous Ruck was just a shadow person. There didn't seem much more I could learn just by looking at him. If I squinted, I thought that maybe I could make out the outline of a belt, ragged sleeves, or the tattered hem of his hood. And that was it. I stared into the empty void of his face, thinking that there was any hidden details. 
that was where I'd find it. But no matter how hard I looked, I couldn't see anything other than those two white eyes. And since my thorough examination of the piece failed to yield any hidden secrets, I felt comfortably reassured that Orville had been full of crap. I even googled Rancorous Ruck and got zero results, which seemed a crushing blow to Orville's claim that there had been multiple paintings by an artist using that pseudonym. I was convinced the painting was a one-off by an unknown artist that had somehow found its way to Orville's shop, and he made up a story to go with it, as he did for all of his wares. I did vaguely recall seeing something about a red ruck in the Harrowick Harrows forum, but I didn't think too much about it. I figured both were drawing inspiration from the same local legend. I tried taking a photo of the portrait with my phone and uploading it to the forum. And that's when things got weird. But when I looked at the portrait through my phone, Ruck was nothing but an amorphous black cloud. There was nothing humanoid about his form at all. The white bits that had been his eyes were now... clearly just breaks in the cloud. I fiddled around with the settings and even the lighting in my room, but nothing could make rancorous Ruck appear on the screen the way he did in the portrait. This got even more unsettling when I tried to take a photo or record a video. Each and every time, the file wouldn't save, no matter what I did. I tried saving it to the device, the SD card, the cloud, nothing worked. At this point, I was starting to get a little freaked out, but, but there were still rational explanations to explore before accepting Orville's cockamamie story. Like, maybe the portrait wasn't from 1947 at all, but was far more modern and embedded with some machine-readable code for digital rights management. But that wasn't really how something like that would work, was it? I would get a notification telling me I didn't have the rights to share the image. It wouldn't just inexplicably be unable to save the file. And it clearly wouldn't automatically censor it the way that it was doing. Could it have been uh, for a joke? Or marketing scheme, then? That still would have been required getting some software onto my phone somehow. Maybe my phone was infected with malware, and it was just a coincidence that the first thing I tried to take a photo of was this creepy painting. It's pretty much all I could think of, aside from the obvious theories about losing my marbles. Frustrated, I tossed my phone aside and leaned in to examine the portrait once again, to see if I could find anything that might explain the incongruity between what I was seeing and what the camera on my phone saw. I found myself staring into Ruck's eyes. The eyes that my phone said were nothing more than empty spaces in a shiftless black form. But they were too deliberately placed and shaped to be anything but eyes. And they'd been painted very distinct white to contrast with the darkness around them, making their presence undeniable. I could even make out the form outline of pupils and irises, though I hadn't noticed them before. In fact, now that I was really looking at them, I could see that they even had corneas, each of which held the reflection of a vague, ghostly figure. It was astonishing. Actually, how much detail had gone into the eyes that would only be noticed up close but then I was really starting to wish my girlfriend had discovered the painting. At least then I'd had a rational excuse to take it back to Orville's. Not that he would have taken it back, he was very clear that the only thing about this shop that wasn't real was his return policy. I tried convincing myself that I was being silly. The whole reason I bought the painting was because it was creepy, and if I had spent as much money on my phone as I had of it, maybe he'd be able to take a decent picture of it. Sighing in defeat, I resigned myself to living with the portrait for at least one night. I mean, if it was still a problem in the light of day, I tried to pawn it off on some gallery or museum for a tax deduction. Sleep, unsurprisingly, eluded me that night. Have you heard of the Tetris effect? It's when you have residual imagery of something that you were really focused on, either in the dark or in your peripheral vision. As I laid in the dark that night, I could see rancorous rock. At first it was just 
his eyes floating in the darkness, his body as amorphous as it had been on my phone, but gradually, he started to take shape. His head, his hood, his mantle, and his limbs, his torso. Finally, his sack, they all slowly emerged as distinct from the surrounding darkness, and I could see him as clearly as if I was looking at his portrait. The child, however, did not appear, leaving Ruck with a free hand. He held up his long fingers to his face to examine them. I thought nothing of it, dismissing it as more of a hypnagogic imagery. And then he lowered his hand. He looked towards me, and a smile made of nothing more than a bright white line broke out across his face. He set a sack on the ground and began noisily rummaging through it. And as I drifted off to sleep, I remember thinking that it was very odd that a residual image on my retina should be able to make any noise at all. It was still night when I awoke again. Still dark, but I could immediately tell something was wrong. My bedroom door was open when I knew that I had it closed. And light was leaking in through the crack when I knew that I turned all the lights off. Panicking, I bolted out of bed and dashed into the living room, ready to confront any intruders with only my bare fists. My machismo vanished pretty quickly when I saw what was waiting for me in that room. In the sepia light of candles that I didn't own, I saw the hunched figure of rancorous Ruck, working ardently at another self-portrait. His back was turned to me, and thus the painting was facing my direction. He had drawn himself emerging out of an inky black patch of mold on an old brick wall, wrapping his hand around the mouth of his victim, while brandishing a knife in the other, and even though his victim's face was mostly covered by his hand, there wasn't the slightest doubt in my mind that it was supposed to be me. He turned around to face me then, his face nothing more than two white dots, and a smile against an impenetrable black void. He held up his brush, heavy with paint that he carelessly let drip to the floor, and moved silently to the side so I could get a better view of his work. I don't think I got your eyes quite right, boy, he mocked in a raspy voice. Hope you can live with that. I didn't respond. Hell, I barely heard him. My heart was pounding so hard. My veins were flooded with adrenaline, but I couldn't will my limbs to move. I was practically catatonic, sweating and shivering as I just stared wide-eyed at the monster painting in my living room. Ruck just snickered in contempt, turning his attention back to his painting and adding a few finishing touches. Only then, when his back was turned and I thought I actually had a chance, did I run. I ran to my apartment door and I threw it open, only to see old Rancor casually standing in the doorframe, blocking my path. Hello, he smirked with an exaggerated wave of his long, mangly fingers. Yes, Dr. Seussesque is what you call them, if I'm not mistaken. A colorful description, I must admit, even if it's not exactly what I was going for. I slammed the door shut, but it just went right through them and he somehow moved up slightly so that I had just shot him into the apartment with me. And I had two choices then. Either fight him head on, or try to reach the fire escape. For absolutely nothing remotely resembling a rational motive, I tried to throttle him and tackle him to the ground. And before I could even make contact though, he slipped behind me with an ethereal ease and leapt upon my back, putting me into a chokehold and muffling my screams with his hand. I frantically tried to buck him off, slamming him against the wall, rolling upon the floor, but he clung to me with a dauntless and uncanny tenacity. It didn't take long for me to exhaust my oxygen supply like that, and I quickly lost consciousness. But I wasn't dead though. Not yet. I awoke at my desk, tied to my chair with my laptop booted up and placed in front of me. It was still night. I probably wasn't out for more than a few minutes. I began frantically looking around for my attacker, and sure enough, he was standing over me with his arms crossed, waiting patiently for me to wake up. What the fuck are you? I demanded, struggling against my binding vaults on the verge of hyperventilation. Exactly what Orville told you. Or at least... Close enough that it's not worth going over again, he replied. 
He bent over and picked up his soggy, dripping sack, and I could see slowly writhing faces, hands, and other body parts pushing against it from the inside, moaning in dull anguish as they thrashed within their burlap prison. See this? In here are all the minds of my old victims, and they're what keeps me going when the world forgets about me. You're going in there too, but not just yet. I have a small favor to ask of you first. Fuck you! I cursed, vehemently spitting at him. He backhanded me so hard my chair toppled over. I was too out of it for a second to notice him putting me back up. But apparently he did, because when I came back to my senses, I was looking at my computer again. Horval was right, you know. Your thoughts sustain me, so all you have to do is to beat me with not thinking of me as a monster, he taunted. His smile twisting into a jagged white scrawl of chalk as he squeezed my cheeks with his prickly, slimy fingers. A shame that's easier said than done. Now you've managed to make one non-trivial contribution to my being, though, aside from my Seuss fingers. You couldn't find a single search result when you've Googled me, and in this day and age, one needs an online presence if one hopes to get anywhere. So here's the deal. I'm gonna paint, and you're gonna write. And if you come up with something postable by the time I finish my painting, you'll get the privilege of going into my sack in one piece. But if you refuse. He held his sack up to my face and pulled it open. Inside was an endless abyss of severed limbs, flayed skins, decapitated heads, scalped faces, all of them still animate and aware. The worst of all, most of them looked like they had come from children. He snapped the bag shut again. Then I tried to muster up the courage to tell him to fuck off again, but... But I couldn't. And so... I'm writing this. Rancorous Ruck's debut post to the interweb, exposing him to a bigger audience than his paintings ever could. I don't know if something written by someone else will infect people the same way his paintings do, but I really hope they don't. But if this post really does infect people, then please know I am truly sorry. The bastard's in my head now. I'm not strong enough to resist him. Once I post this, I'm gonna be in the sack. And maybe you think that's what I deserve for going into Ranker's demands. But if you pity me at all, and you ever happen to be in Sombre Marie, then please, please, do me one favor. Burn Orville's shop to the ground. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Kooby Pasta, and I just wanted to let you know before we get started on tonight's story that tonight's story is written by the ever-famous author, Christopher Maxim. Christopher Maxim has been known to write many different stories that have become pretty big on the channel over the years, and if you'd like to get more from Christopher Maxim, you can find his full list of Amazon books in the description down below. As well as, if you'd like to support Chris Maxim in any way, you can find the links there in the description as well. And now, on to tonight's story. Room 371. Some hotel near the Cape. I was on a business trip with my boss, closing in on the final set of investors that we needed to launch our latest startup. That's all I can remember, and then this. Waking up in a bedroom next to an unfamiliar woman with a literal set of credits appearing and disappearing in front of me, suspended in the air. How very strange. <laughs> what was that? What was that? What was that? It was a, a, a laugh reel. A, a studio audience, wait. Is my inner dialogue not so inner after all? <laughs> Just then, the woman to my right woke up and placed her arm over my chest. 
Hey, hon. How'd you sleep? This was a dream, right? It had to be. I, I fell asleep in my hotel room and s some program on TV was leaking in. It was, cre it was creating this setting. I just don't remember going to bed. I never sleep with the TV on, not even at home. Uh, not so good, hun. Aw, <laughs> oh, what's the matter? Wake up on the wrong side of the bed? No, not really. It feels like I woke up in the wrong bed altogether. <laughs> the scene faded and reconstructed into a dining room where I was now seated with my dream wife. We were eating omelets. I now have the Sunday paper in my hand, though I can't make out a single image or word. It's a jumbled mess of black and white lines. No text at all, from what I could tell. The unfamiliar woman spoke up. You know, Hank. I interjected. Hank? Who's Hank? <laughs> Very funny. As I was saying, I really don't appreciate being ignored when we're at the table. You're always buried in that damn paper. Would it kill you to look at me every once in a while, ask me how I'm doing for a change? I'm your wife for crying out loud. You mean this paper? I gestured toward the messy collection of illegible markings in front of me. It's nothing but black lines. I'm not reading anything. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You've been sitting there with a fake paper just to avoid talking to your own wife? I cook the meals, clean the house, walk the damn dog. We have a dog? <laughs> All I ask is for some appreciation. Anything to let me know I mean something to you. Look, hon. Don't you look, hon, me. Gosh, you make me so angry. I could just, just... She picked up her fork and walked over to me. A look of pure rage painted on her face. She then lifted the fork back and plunged it down into my hand. The one holding the paper, effectively pinning it to the table. <laughs> Try lifting your precious paper to read it now. The pain is immense. A shockwave resonated throughout my entire body. Then there was the blood oozing out of the holes in my hand, forming a dark red pool that dripped off the table and onto my lap. This is no dream. This is no dream. It was all too real. My sitcom wife was still seeing red. She raced into the kitchen and came back with a cleaver in hand. All the while, I screamed and sobbed over the damage my hand had sustained. I, I quickly pulled the fork out and tossed it at her and bolted upstairs. Before she could get to me, the scene faded again. Next thing I knew, I was locked in a bathroom. The sound of thunderous banging came from the other side of the door. Hank, sweetie, you can't stay in there all day. I searched for a way out. But there was no windows. Think, Jack, think, think. Without warning, an axe crashed through the wood of the door, an unhinged expression of an angered woman visible through the shrapnel. Here's Janie. <laughs> oh, Janie, so that's your name. It's lovely to meet you. I'm Jack. <laughs> nice try, Hank. No more psychological warfare. I've had enough of your head games to last a lifetime. We end this now, once and for all. I expected more audience reactions, but there was none. From this point forward, they were silent. Nothing but the unsettling sound of the metal meeting wood as Janie tore through the door to get to me. As I looked around at the cheap Hollywood wallpaper, something hit me. It didn't look quite right, quite real, in fact. Is this a set? I wondered. I jabbed one of the walls and my hand went clean through it. I'll be damned. Without a moment's hesitation, I burst out of there and walked off set, right past the studio audience and camera crew. The exit was in view. A black door with a large sign illuminated above it. Leave if you dare, Jack. Just as I to close a gap, a man appeared before me, clean cut, mid-fifties, maybe, maybe gray hair, gray mustache. He was grinning from ear to ear. Not so fast, Jack. Did you think it would be that easy? Who the hell are you? He let out a slight grunt, clearly insulted by my query. You are in no position to ask questions, but if you must know, you're in my room. Your room? I asked, completely confused. Think, Jack. Room 371. The hotel? Ringing any bells? Some memories flashed in my mind. My boss and I were at a hotel, of which I now remembered the name. It was the Covenwood Inn, and this man standing before me, he was there too. I walked by him on the way to my room. He tipped his hat. He mumbled something to me. What was it? 
enjoy your stay, perhaps. You were there. At the hotel. Now you're getting it, Jack. I'm always there. Anything else come to mind? I remember the door. And the number 371 affixed to the plaque, but I couldn't recall entering it or what happened next. Something else happened, but the memories are just too out of reach. It'll come to you, Jack. For now, there's no escaping. You are my prisoner. With that, the man vanished. So too did the exit. I swung around to make a run to the opposite direction, but it was too late. The studio audience was no longer seated. They had me surrounded, and the film crew now had their cameras pointed at me as the director yelled out overhead, And action! The audience closed in on me with mouths wide open, their laughter echoing through the building, their eyes glazed over, their arms resting at their sides as they marched at me. It was a sickening sight, and then, just as I thought it was a goner, the scene faded, transitioning me to another location. I felt myself drifting as the view grew dimmer, collapsing into unconsciousness. I attempted to fight it, but it was no use. Whatever was putting me under had a vicious hold over me. As I slipped away, I heard the man's voice ringing in my ears. Wake up, Jack. My eyes opened, and the transition was complete. I awoke at home, in bed, next to my real wife, Charlotte. She rolled over and gently caressed her arm across my chest. How'd you sleep, hon? I smiled. Captivated by her as the sun washed over our room. <sighs> Just fine. Thank God it was all a dream. We got out of bed and went downstairs to the dining room table. I whipped up some of my famous French toast. We ate and then talked for hours. It was a perfect day. I hoped it would never end. Unfortunately for me... Nothing lasts forever. Hey, I want to show you something. Wait right there. Charlotte left the room and went upstairs. A few minutes later, she came back downstairs and... plopped... a dead body down in front of me. It was Leslie. Our daughter. I stood up, and I backed away. Charlotte, what are you doing? Leslie's dead, Jack. <laughs> laughter? That could only mean... Oh no. Oh no, I didn't wake up. I'm still here. The walls came crashing down around me. The floodgates opened, and I remember, Leslie was in fact dead. She, she had died just a few months previous. Our beautiful daughter was ripped away from us, and it was... It was all my fault. You did this, Jack. You and your damn job. How hard is it for a father to pick up his own daughter from school? How could you have been so sidetracked? It was true. I was always wrapped up in work. On the day in question, I was on an important phone call and lost track of time. Charlotte was at her job, and I was supposed to pick up Leslie. She wound up walking home and was, was struck by a car before even reaching the halfway point. She, she was dead on impact. My little girl. Struck like a common animal on the side of the road. Leslie's corpse sat up and stared at me. How could you forget me, Daddy? Her cold, dead fingers reached for my neck and started squeezing the air from my lungs. I pushed her away, and her body turned to ash as it hit the floor, leaving just me and Charlotte. I wasn't any safer. Charlotte pulled a knife out from under her back and took a swing, grazing my cheek. <laughs> Charlotte, put the knife down, please. I can't, Jack. I blame you. I have all this anger and sadness and nothing to do with it. It's all because of you. I can't take it anymore, Jack. I just can't. A flood of tears rolled down her face as she began hysterically crying. She swung again and I grabbed her arm. Charlotte, please, please, I love you. We can get through this. I'll, I'll find you some help and we'll... Somewhere in the struggle without realizing it, I'd inadvertently pushed the blade into her stomach. 
the blood poured out faster than her tears had. Charlotte fell to her knees and then collapsed on the floor. The life quickly left her eyes as she offered me a final sentiment. I'll see her, Jack. I'll finally see our daughter again. And that was it. She died. Aside from the reanimated corpse, that's how it all actually happened. Charlotte blamed me, wanted to see me pay for our daughter's death, and in a way, I... I guess I did. After that, I was alone. Utterly and hopelessly. Alone. With the memory of killing my family. The scene faded one last time, revealing room 371 at the Coven Inn. The clean-cut man standing before me, another smile on his face. Well, Jack... Do you remember now? I did remember. There was no business trip. That was more likely just a fabrication of my brain to make sense of why I was there in the first place. In actuality, I was at the hotel to kill myself. Yes, I think I do. Take a minute, Jack. Do you remember how we met? I met him in the hallway on the way to my room. He said he could bring them back. New things about our life that no one should possibly know. All, all I had to do was cross the threshold into room 371 and it would be done. I was a drunk mess, but how could I turn him down? He did warn me there would be a terrible price to pay, but I didn't care. I was ready to end my life, after all. I agreed, and we went our separate ways. The last thing he said was, Enjoy your stay. I do. I remember everything, but what just happened here? Was any of that real? He pointed down at my hand, which I had just then noticed was hurting. I saw the four puncture wounds from where Janie's fork scratched me. It was very real, Jack. You struck a deal and held up your end of the bargain. By entering the room, you agreed to my terms and gave me something I needed. Now I'll bring your precious family back to you as promised. I still didn't quite understand, and he could tell. It wasn't chance that our paths crossed, Jack. This is my room. It's where I make all of my deals. It draws in those with the deepest of despair compelling them to take their lives within, and that's where I come in. I save you, in a sense. Saved me. Is that what he called it? You, Jack, a man with nothing to live for, have just signed away your life to me. What you just experienced is a down payment. I wiped your memory, made you relive your worst experience as though it were happening for the first time, in my fun little way, of course, you see, this room is my own personal torture chamber. It's where I pull apart souls through physical and psychological torment. With every wound endured, small bits of the soul's aura fall off and are absorbed by yours truly. The little pieces that make up who you are. By the time I'm done, what's left is no longer human. and I'm revitalized. That's what keeps me young. So that's it. You're done, right? It's, it's all over. The man laughed. No, Jack. That was just a down payment. At some point in the near future, I'll show up to collect. Then you and your family will live here for what will feel like an eternity. This will be your new home. My heart sank when I realized what he was saying. W wait a minute. What do you mean, my family? You want them back? And you'll get them. For a while? Then you're all mine. That's the price. When I have all three of you, I'm sure I'll think of even more creative ways to poke and prod you. I bet you wish life was as simple as some sitcom right about now, don't you, Jack? My breathing became labored and sporadic, and my heart began pounding out of my chest. What have I done? Calm down, Jack. Go home. 
and enjoy your family while you still can. The man, or whatever he was, took his leave and walked out of the hotel room, but not before turning back and shooting me one last terrible grin. See you soon, Jack. It was a pleasure doing business with you. My older brother Mark disappeared when I was just seven. The last memory I have of him comes from a lazy Saturday afternoon in the summer of 2008. He was lying in our backyard porch with a bunch of his high school friends, eating ice cream cones and arguing about horror movies or something. I don't know, I never paid much attention to the conversations, but I do know they were excited about going to their first real party later that night. I came outside to give Mark a gift. It was a charm bracelet I'd made for him from a series of strung-together Lego blocks. For good luck, I told him. Mark looked at the bracelet. I'd scrawled letters on it in Sharpie, one letter per block. Together they spelled out Mookie, my nickname for him since I was a toddler. Mark just laughed and pocketed the bracelet. Thanks, Smelly, he said, tussling my hair. I remember yelling at him and growing red in the face. And then I ran back inside. Don't call me that, I yelled. Those were the last words I ever said to my brother. Mark and his friends were headed to the Swamp Soiree that night. A tradition in Bartram Forest High School. Every year, a group of popular seniors would throw a big end-of-the-summer bash in the outskirts of the Okie Swamp, a massive wilderness area in northern Florida, about a half hour from our home in suburban Jacksonville. The soiree was basically a big kegger with a bonfire where everyone got drunk, smoked pot, and hooked up in their cars, or, if they were really wasted, in the mud. The area was remote enough that no police ever came by, and there was no locals to piss off. The party's exact location was kept secret, shared only to those fortunate enough to be invited. Swamp soirees were known for their lethal amount of alcohol and drugs. The kids who threw them always came from wealthy families. They brought multiple kegs of Blue Moon or Stella, handles of top-shelf liquor, bags of dank-ass weed, and occasionally cocaine. Mark and his friends arrived early that night, before most others had shown up. According to his friends, some douchey baseball player pressured him into doing a 20-second keg stand. Shortly afterwards, Mark told his friends that he was going to take a piss. He looked pale and sweaty. Like he was going to throw up, his friend Eric told me years later. The last time anyone saw him, Mark was stumbling around in the darkened woods headed deeper into the Okie Gobi Swamp. Two hours later, his friends drunkenly searched the same wilderness, calling out his name while sinking halfway into the mud. Two days later, my parents searched the area with local law enforcement. Two weeks later, a 400-person search and rescue operation combed the Okigobi Swamp, equipped with helicopters, john boats, and multiple foot teams. And two years later, the final official search ended, this time with cadaver dogs. No one ever found anything. It was like Mark had vanished from existence entirely. One moment, there was a smart, sci-fi-obsessed teenager who wanted to design robots that explored distant planets, get married, and raise 3.5 kids while living in Miami. And the next moment... Nothing. Blue, place your unit. You smell. I never participated in any official search for my brother. I was too young, but years later, when I was in college at Florida State, I applied for a summer internship at the Okie Gobi National Park, in part to look for anything that might have been missed. I'd always been interested in the wilderness, even though my parents never let me go camping or hiking after what happened. They wouldn't even let me play in the woods of our backyards, but that only made me long for such places even more. Mark loved being outside. Being in the wild was one of the only ways to keep his spirit alive. One of my earliest memories was of us hiking together on the trails at Guana River State Park. We'd run ahead of our parents till it was just us in the wild green world full of sprawling oaks, 
wide marshes and endless mystery. As kids, we fantasized about running away to live in the woods, like a modern-day version of Swiss Family Robinson. We'd never have to go to school. We could stay up as late as we wanted. It'd be total freedom. When I went in for my first interview at the Okie Park headquarters, the head interp ranger, George Craig, saw my last name and raised his eyebrow. Ellie Brooks? I'm the little sibling of Mark Brooks, I said, answering the question that was forming in his bald head. I helped lead the first search party for him, he explained. Really sad. Very sorry for your loss. Thanks, I told him. I was using the internship as a way of coping with his loss. He hired me on the spot. The job was simple enough. Most of it consisted of manning the park, museum, the gift shops, and talking to the visitors. They would come in to browse the dioramas on swamp wildlife or peruse books on bird watching. The park received visitors from all over the country, but most were locals from the nearby towns of Okani, population 604. They were usually older folks who were retired, stopping by day after day just to talk. These locals had all sorts of crazy stories about the Okigobi Swamp. It turned out Okani was known for two things. It's massive paper mill, which gives the area a noxious fart smell when the wind blows north to south, and its town mascot, the infamous Swamp Rex. Okani sits along the eastern edge of the Okigobi Swamp. It's the only human civilization within 50 miles of the wilderness. As such, the town has experienced many unusual animal encounters over the years. Everyone who's ever owned a swimming pool there found a full-grown alligator floating in it at least once. Water moccasins sometimes coiled up in the town's roads to catch warmth in the winter. And locals love to say how the deer population vastly outnumbered the human one. But not all creatures could be explained. Since as far back as 1889, people in the area talked of an eight-foot-tall humanoid alligator. One that roamed the swamps at night, killing anyone who littered, polluted, or otherwise disrespected the natural ecosystem. They called it the Swamp Rex. Most reports stated that the creature had glowing green eyes, a long, powerful tail that could break bone, and an elongated head full of spear-like crocodilian teeth. The Swamp Rex would hunt at night, then return to its muddy hole somewhere deep inside the swamp where no one feared to tread. I first learned of the Swamp Rex from my older brother. As a child, Mark was fascinated with cryptozoology, the study of unverified creatures like Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster. He used to tell me campfire stories about the Rex when we were little, how it was millions of years old, would travel throughout the swamp via series of underground caves. The story scared the bejeevus out of me, but I loved every second of it. He told me once that he wanted to go on an expedition into the heart of the Okigobi to find the creature. I was the only other person who wanted to go with him. It sounded like the perfect adventure, like something out of my favorite movie, Jurassic Park. Mark and I never went on that expedition, though. He lost interest in stupid fake monsters by the time he was a senior in high school. I doubted the Rex was even on his mind when he attended the Swamp Soiree that fateful night. Mark never saw the Swamp Rex, but many others have claimed that they've seen it over the years, even though the legend dated back to the newspaper article in the late 1800s. It didn't really become known until March of 1989, when O'Connor sugarcane farmer Bill Howard noticed a tall man wandering the edge of his property late one autumn evening. Howard lived in a remote farm on the outskirts of town, right next to the Okigobi Swamp. If it was a man, he'd have to walk miles through mighty thick woods just to get to my backyard, Howard told reporters. Keeping his eyes on the figure, the farmer grabbed his 12-gauge shotgun and a camcorder that he'd recently got for Christmas. I knew right away something wasn't right about it. It stood like a man, but it had this big tail and it moved with kind of a animal grace, he said. Instead of aiming his gun, Howard raised his camcorder and shot the first known footage of the Swamp Rex. The creature only appeared for about five seconds on screen before fleeing deeper into the woods. It was somewhat hard to make out, given the footage was shot from a hundred yards away 
and during the twilight, but even with a low-resolution 1980s era camera, people could see the figure had a tail and an elongated head, just like the Swamp Rex stories of old. Soon afterwards, Bill Howard's footage aired on the local news and gradually spread throughout the country via cryptozoological outlets like the Weekly World News and nascent internet forums on the paranormal. Eventually, the creature made its way into greater pop culture. In the 1990s, The X-File aired a Monster of the Week episode loosely based on the Rex, and the History Channel did a special on it for its Monster Quest series in 2009. Over time, tourists started showing up in Okani, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature themselves. Various gift shops opened up selling all kinds of Swamp Rex merchandise, from t-shirts to mugs to alligator hats, even Swamp Rex IPA beer. People came from all over the country. Most were skeptics, just looking for a wacky Florida story to tell. But some were true believers. Many even believed that Rex was involved in real-life disappearances tied to the Okie area. Since 1980, over 50 people have gone missing in or around the swamp, including my older brother. The most famous case happened in the early 1990s, when a wealthy land developer named Jerry Flagler vanished after witnesses last saw him in the Okie area with some business partners. He was going to illegally cut down them trees, Okani's town historian Mary Madrigal told reporters. But the Rex took him before he could. Like Mark, the authorities never found Flagler's body. By 2019, when I was working at the Okigobi National Park, the Swamp Rex had become a vital part of Okani's lore. A cartoon version of it was even featured on the town sign, though they didn't know my relation. Many of the locals who visited the park would tell me stories about what really happened to Mark Brooks. Most of them believed the Swamp Rex took my brother because he was disrespecting the land by being at the swamps where I... How come it didn't take anyone else then? I would ask, innocently. There were at least a hundred other kids at that party that night. The locals usually didn't have an answer to the question, or they'd make up some bullshit excuse like, well, maybe he was the only one littering. The only drunken high school student who littered. My brother was officially pronounced dead on July 12th, 2012. His cause of death was listed as probable drowning. The only theory that seemed reasonable. The area where Mark was last seen had a lot of deep pools of water connecting to the Okani River. Given his level of inebriation at the time, it was easy to assume he'd simply fallen into such pools. Mark never learned to swim, so then his body was later washed out to sea via the river, which runs from the Okigobi Swamp to the Gulf of Mexico. Even though I didn't believe the Swamp Rex theory, like Mark before me, I'd come to the realization that monsters were always a hoax or a cause of mistaken identity, I still couldn't quite live with the drowning explanation. I needed something more. Another part of my job was called roving, where I walked the trails and the boardwalks to the Okigobi National Park, talking to visitors and looking for anything suspect. I did this a few times a week. I didn't carry a firearm, that was for law enforcement, rangers only, not intrepid ones, and definitely not someone doing a college internship. But I did have a high-powered radio that could contact an LE in case of emergencies, and I always wore a flat hat, something you've probably seen from many Smokey the Bear ads, so hikers could spot me a mile away. Sometimes they asked about wildlife and the history of the swamp. Most of the time they came to complain about the lack of certain facilities, like trash cans. I roved the wilderness of the Okigobi Swamp for one reason. I was determined to find something, anything, any remnant of my brother's existence even if it was just the stupid charm bracelet I'd given him the day he disappeared. I knew all the search parties before me had covered the same ground, but there was still plenty of stories of someone finding clues in the exact same location people had searched years earlier. It was possible. It had to be. A few months in my job, I was roving the North Boardwalk when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. 
a flash of movement. It looked like a lanky teenager, you know, the figure dashed out into the surrounding cypress trees, disappearing into an area that was usually flooded. I have expected the runaway to sink waist deep into the mud. This was late March, and it hadn't rained in a month. The land was as dry as it could get, and the mysterious individual had moved expertly through it. I reached for my radio, planning to call in the incident. Someone's gone off the designated trail, I would have said. In most situations, this is something an LE ranger would handle, but something made me put the radio down. A lingering feeling. That kid. Was it a boy? He looked almost... like Mark. I should have taken it as a warning sign. I wish I'd just radioed the LE ranger. Instead, I stepped off the boardwalk and I started into the woods. There was nothing in the area where the figure was headed. My NPS map just showed a blank spot on the northern edge of the swamp. Because of its extreme density and uninhabitable terrain, almost half of the Okigobi is uncharted. Most of its land is hidden beneath four feet of murky brown water and another five feet of black muck. Too difficult to walk through for any detailed surveys. I looked for the kid in the cypress trees ahead, but I couldn't see any movement. I did see the occasional shoe print in the mud, however. It looked like a converse shoe, definitely not something that you'd want in such terrain. The intermittent tracks led deeper and deeper into the swamp. I came across one every ten or twenty yards. At one point I stopped to take a drink from my bottle, and was shocked to see a full two hours had passed. It was almost 5 p.m. Shit! I was supposed to be back at the park headquarters to start closing procedure 30 minutes ago. How is it already five? It felt like I'd stepped off the boardwalk only moments before. I started to backtrack. I planned to let an Ellie know about the lost kid, but first, I needed an excuse for being so late. Was I helping a lost hiker find his way back to the trailhead? Did I have to clean up a bunch of trash on the boardwalk? I was about to radio headquarters when I felt my boots slip out from under me, and I stumbled down a small muddy hill. My body crashed through a dense thicket of palmetto bushes. Dazed, I struggled to my feet, wiped off as much dirt as I could. My green slacks and gray-collared shirt had turned black from muck. My flat hat was crushed, my radio was cracked and unusable. And my cell phone was caked in mud. But as soon as I saw my surroundings, I forgot about everything else. I was inside a campsite, almost an acre in size. The place was astonishing and had an old canvas tent pitched between a sprawling live oak, a fire pit, a small garden, a composite station, a dugout latrine, even a plastic tarp for catching rainwater. A series of large ceramic jars stood by the rain catcher. They looked to be storing water. There was no one around. The tent was empty, but I could tell the site was still inhabited. Everything was well maintained, and the fire pit had some recently burned coals in its center. Who could be living here? I wondered. Was it the boy I was chasing? Was he hiding in the bushes somewhere nearby, afraid of getting caught? No, whoever had been living in that site had been there for years, perhaps even decades. The camp was surrounded by dense palmetto bushes and the makeshift wall of driftwood. It was so well camouflaged that I realized... I had already walked past it before falling down the hill. Hello? I said tentatively. There was no response. Cicadas droned from the nearby trees. I was about to leave when something along the far edge of the camp caught my attention. It appeared to be a crude statue carved out of an old tree trunk and decorated with various objects. As I approached, its details came into focus. A statue depicted a humanoid figure with an alligator head, a large, muscular tail, clearly meant to be the Swamp Rex. There were various objects around it. Some had been laid at the creature's feet, a moldy tennis shoe, a broken compass, part of a child's lunchbox. Others were draped over its body, a baseball cap, canteen, golden necklace bearing a cross. They were arrayed in a specific pattern as if the statue were some kind of shrine. I crept closer, almost mesmerized by the mysterious display. And that's when I saw it. A bracelet. 
made of Lego blocks, hanging around the statue's left wrist. My breath stopped. All noise faded. I, I reached out and I grabbed the bracelet. The letters were faint, but still legible. Mookie. It was the very bracelet I'd given my older brother the day he disappeared. My skin felt prickly with fear and worry. I put the bracelet in my vest pocket and then turned around, looking in all directions. Mark? There was no response. The campsite was perfectly still. My eyes scanned the tent, the garden, the, the compost heat, the latrine, the... A male figure, hidden in shadow, standing at the edge of the woods, motionless. I gasped. How long had he been there? It was too dark to make out the man's features. Could it be... Mark? Somehow I already knew the answer. There was a loud hiss. And very slowly the figure stepped into the light. A six foot tall man. Mid to late fifties with a muscular frame, scraggly gray hair. A hermit. His wiry body was covered in dirt, mud, and bug bites. And he... He was completely naked. The hermit stared at me with bloodshot eyes, his expression unreadable. Angry? Scared? Confused? My stomach wretched with fear. Every alarm bell in my brain was ringing simultaneously. S -s 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 Sorry. Sorry, uh, I stammered, backing away with my hands up. I, I didn't mean to. I, I, I can leave. The hermit opened his cracked lips to reveal rotten, yellowed teeth. He hissed producing a noise so low and resonant it sounded like a giant snake. I jumped back, falling on my behind at the foot of the shrine. N no, please! But the hermit didn't attack. Instead, he grabbed something from within the tent. S something big. It looked like a pile of clothes. When he brought it out, I nearly screamed. I it was a suit made of thick, reptilian skin. The hermit had it stitched together, pieces of alligator hide to form a Swamp Rex costume. It had long sleeves that ended in clawed gloves, a hood made of an alligator skull, webbed feet, even a tail. The monster suit was ugly as sin, but also intricate, terrifying, mesmerizing. The hermit started to put it on. His movements were slow and deliberate, like this was all part of some ritual. What? What are you? I crawled backwards, keeping my eyes on him the whole time. My fingers brushed against a piece of driftwood. A potential weapon. The hermit stepped forward, wearing his swamp wreck suit. He looked like a mutant from the bowels of hell. The man hissed again, his voice amplified by the gator skull. It was louder, more guttural. I grabbed a hold of the driftwood piece and stood up. The branch was small but solid like a billy club. I raised it up defensively, and Mark's bracelet fell from my vest pocket. The hermit stared at the bracelet and hissed again. He took a step back. Cautiously, I picked up the bracelet with my free hand and held it out so the hermit could see it more clearly. It hung loosely from my fingertips. Where? Where, where did you get this? No response. Do you know Mark Brooks? I asked again, trying to sound a bit more confident. With his gloved hand, the hermit pointed to the ceramic jars standing beneath the rain catcher. The ones that held water. I don't understand. Can you speak? The hermit didn't say anything. He walked over to the jars, his reptilian hands brushing across the top of each one until he tipped the last jar over. Crash! A gallon of slimy liquid poured out along with along with a pile of big white sticks. No. No, not sticks. Bones. Inside of the jar was a complete human skeleton. Its bones all mashed together. Oh, fuck. I stammered. This was his answer. I was looking at Mark spilled across the ground like some carnivore's leftovers. No, 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 no. Yes! The hermit raised his gloved hands. His eyes shone within the gator's skull. My whole body shook. Sweat poured down my face. This was it. The end. 
I had my answer, and I would pay the ultimate price for it un until I saw him. The boy who had run from the boardwalk so many hours ago. The one I'd been following. It was Mark, still 18 years old and wearing the same faded jeans and long sleeve shirt from the night he had disappeared. He looked at me. Then he pointed at something lying against the tent. A, a gun, a shotgun. I threw the driftwood at the hermit as hard as I could, then sprinted for the tent. Five feet, three, two, one. I grabbed the gun with shaky hands. There was just enough time to turn. Blood spattered my face. The blast threw the hermit backwards. His six-foot-tall body fell to the ground with a thud. It all happened so fast. I, I didn't even realize I'd pulled the trigger until afterwards. Smoke curled from the barrel of the shotgun. I let out a sharp cry. There was half a cough, half a sob. The hermit lay motionless a few feet away. I pumped the shotgun a second time as I stepped towards him, finger still on the trigger. He never got up. Afterwards, I looked all over the camp for Mark, calling out his name, but aside from the split-second moment before the attack, I never saw my brother again. To this day, I wonder if I ever saw him at all. Perhaps it was all nerves. Perhaps my brother was just a manifestation of my intense fear upon finding the real swamp wrecks. Looking back, I'm struck by how similar the hermit's campsite was to the Swiss family Robinson-style house that Mark and I had imagined that we'd lived in when we were little, aside from the obscene shrine and jars, of course. The police cornered off the entire site the next day. Aside from Mark, they found the remains of 12 other people, even the wealthy land developer Jerry Flagler. News vans came from all over, word of the Swamp Wreck's discoveries, spread internationally. Most importantly, our family finally had a proper burial for my brother that proved that provided some much-needed closure. My parents and I wept for weeks on end. So far, the police have not been able to identify the hermit. Even after analyzing dental records, completing a DNA profile, and sending his picture to various news outlets, been numerous theories, of course. You know, some said that the hermit was Michael Jenkins, an escaped mental patient who, who vanished from a South Florida asylum 40 years ago, though the photos didn't bear much resemblance. Others claimed various serial killers who had never been caught, like the, like the Zodiac. And some even believed that the hermit was planted by the federal government to cover up the existence of the real creature. But no one came forward with any solid evidence nothing verifiable. The hermit has remained as mysterious as the swamp creature that he had pretended to be for so many years. And I've since moved clear across the country. I currently reside in the vast metropolis of Los Angeles. I don't go hiking anymore. I never go camping. I hardly ever even leave the house. But each night I dream. I dream that I'm still deep in that swamp, alone in my cold, reptilian skin. I am the hermit. And the thing that worries me the most is... I enjoy it. My childhood was mostly a blur. I never had the best memory, and my childhood was also pretty uneventful. So there isn't too much for me to remember anyway, at least, at least that's what I thought. And then, about a week ago, I remembered him. He was a spindly man with limbs so thin they looked brittle, like they would break if bent the wrong way. But he could twist them in all sorts of unnatural directions, and his face it was gaunt with his cheeks sunk deep into his skull, but he was always smiling, always. He had a red dot painted on each side of his sunken cheeks, a little like a clown. And then there were his eyes. Now, I remember the day I saw him. I remember every detail, which is rare for me. I was six. My parents were taking me to my grandmother's house. She lived fairly close, but it had been several months 
since I'd last seen her. It was... It was dusk. We were going for dinner. Like most grandmothers, mine was an excellent cook, so I was looking forward to it. We arrived, and after the usual comments about how tall I was getting, we had dinner. I don't remember what it was, just that it was delicious. I scarfed it down within a couple of minutes. The problem was that there wasn't much for a kid like me to do at Grandma's house once I'd eaten. There was plenty of books, but I couldn't read yet, so I asked her if she had any toys. She smiled at me and told me to check the closet in the guest bedroom, where she had stored all the toys from when my dad and his siblings were kids. I was curious to see what toys my dad had grown up with, so I did. Grandma apparently didn't have guests spend the night often, because the guest room was almost totally empty. Like, there wasn't even a bed. There was an old wooden chair sitting in the corner, and a blank picture frame hanging on the chipped wall. The floor was dusty, and it seemed like Grandma didn't go into the room often. The closet door was set in the far corner of the room. I walked around it and opened the door. My little hand just big enough to turn the knob. Inside, a collection of ancient-looking coats hung, obscuring the back of the closet. But I was more interested in the cardboard boxes sitting on the floor, each of which sported the word toys, scrawled on their side in Sharpie. I pulled one out and opened it, and inside was a fascinating collection of old playthings. Yo-yos, army men, even a couple of battered action figures. I was examining one of them when I heard movement from inside the closet. The sound of shuffling and then soft thump. Who's there? I asked. No response. Who's there? I demanded again. Shh. Shh. A voice said from inside the closet. Nobody's here. That's not true. You're here, I said. For some reason, my stupid six-year-old self wasn't scared, just curious. And a little fascinated. So I am, the voice said. It sounded old, but freakishly happy at the same time. Just ignore me. Why don't you come out? I asked. Because I'll scare you. I'm scary looking. If I come out, you'll scream. I won't scream. I promise, I won't scream. Will you come out now? Maybe. A moment later, a hand poked out from behind the coats. It was so bony, it could have been skeletal if it weren't for the thin layer of skin stretched tightly over it. A second hand followed it, equally withered, and the two hands parted the coats, revealing a face. That gaunt face with a wide smile and the painted dots on the cheeks. His eyes were closed, but I knew somehow that he could see me, and for some reason, for some reason, I wasn't afraid of him. I think I was just too young and stupid to realize how weird this whole thing was. But true to my word, I didn't scream. He crawled out of the closet on all fours, sat down in front of me. I, uh, he said, you're a cute little fellow, huh? I guess so, I said. Why do you look so funny? I don't know. I've never seen what I look like before, but I think I'm scary looking because whenever someone sees me, they scream. Except you. You don't scream. I don't think you're scary, I said. Just weird. Hmm, he mused to himself. What's your name? I asked. I don't know, he said. I don't have a name. I don't want one either. Oh. I didn't understand why he wouldn't want a name. I was about to ask him what I was supposed to call him if he didn't have a name. But I didn't. I don't know why. So, you want to play with me? He asked. I know some fun tricks. What tricks can you do? I asked. He stood up, then made his way across the room to the old chair. He grabbed the top with one hand and hoisted himself up off the ground like an acrobat, 
and then he began to twist. His limbs were bending all the wrong ways, but I couldn't stop watching him. He twirled upside down, twisting all his joints. After about five minutes, he finally lowered himself down and slowly crawled back over to me. How's that for a trick? He asked. That was amazing, I said. And it had been. I'd never seen anything move like that before. Glad to hear it, he said. Say, why don't we go play in my closet? We can have more fun in there. I looked over at the closet. It was dark and a little spooky. I wasn't sure I wanted to go back inside. I... I don't know about that, I said. I think maybe I should go now. No, don't go, he said. Stay with me. We can have fun forever and ever. Come on. I don't want to, I said. I want to go. Please. No. And then his smile, which had remained fixed on his face the whole time, drooped a bit. Get in the closet, he said. Though his voice was different now, it was quieter. He carried a sharp, bladed edge. It'll be fun, I swear. I'm not going in the closet. You're, sc you're starting to scare me. Am I? Sorry. If you come with me, I promise I won't scare you anymore. His smile faltered even more. No, I'm not going in the closet. I'm leaving, I said. And then I stood up. I took a step towards the door. And what was left of his smile twisted, morphing into a heinous frown. His teeth were sharp, triangular points. Uh, how had I not noticed that before? Goosebumps were running down my arm and legs, and suddenly I knew that I needed to get out of there, but I didn't. I tried to move, but I found it. I was paralyzed. Then his eyes, which had remained closed the entire time, slid open. I screamed. They weren't eyes. They were voids, wide, empty gaps that were filled only with darkness, and even as I screamed, I couldn't look away from them. They called to me somehow, and I knew that if I didn't get out, I would be lost in them forever. He rushed at me then, his spindly arms surging forward, reaching out to grab me, his frowning mouth opening so wide I could have fit my head into it with room to spare, and that was what broke me out of my trance. I ran for the door as fast as my little legs could carry me. His clawed hands just centimeters away from me, grasped me. I flung the door open, and I could feel his claws run along my back as I bolted through it. I slammed the door shut. Catching his hands between the door and the frame, I heard his screech from inside the room, and he yanked it back, letting the door shut properly. I saw this and I kept running. I kept running down the hall, into the kitchen, and finally into the dining room, where my parents and grandmother were still talking. I ran into my mother's lap and I wrapped my arms around her, crying. They asked me what was wrong and I told them about the thing that I'd met in the guest room. They didn't believe me. I remember my dad saying, quite an imagination, huh, to my grandmother and laughing. After we went home that night, I, I somehow forgot about the whole incident completely. I forgot about the guest bedroom, the strange being I met there, those horrific eyes. All of it. I grew up, I finished school, I moved out. And I never thought about him. Until a week ago. I was walking home from a local coffee shop one morning and having to pass a skinny man with a very gaunt, pale face and sunken cheeks and eyes. Strange, I thought. He looks familiar. He looks like... And then I remembered everything. That memory had haunted me constantly for the past few days. I, I spent every spare moment thinking about it. I wonder what would have happened to me if I had gone into the closet with him, like he asked. I wonder what he would have done to me if he'd caught me. And I hoped... It was just a dream, some crazy, random nightmare I had that somehow resurfaced when I saw that man on the street. That was the only remotely logical explanation I could come up with. And yesterday, curiosity got the better of me once again, and I went back to my grandmother's house. She died almost five years ago, but I was hoping to talk to whoever was living there currently. I had to see that room again. You see, I, I had to know. The current resident of the house was a woman in her late 20s. She looked 
very confused when I first knocked on the door, but I explained that my grandmother used to live in this house and that there was something I wanted to check on. She agreed to let me look and even offered me some snacks, which I declined. Well, she told me that she'd converted the guest bedroom into an art studio where she painted, but that she barely touched the closet at all, apart from getting rid of the boxes and the jackets. When I stepped inside, however, I was surprised to see a piece of wood lying on the floor of the otherwise empty closet. I knelt down to pick it up and I saw that it was inscribed with the phrase, Nobody's here. A chorus of chills ran down my back at the familiar words. I turned the wood over, wondering if there was something written on the other side. There was. It said. You weren't dreaming. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we've just started off 2021, hopefully pretty well here. It's been 10 years now since the channel's gotten started, and since then, man, we've kind of done a shit ton. If you'd like to check out more of what I've done, you can always follow me at twitch.tv slash Mr. Creepypasta to hear me recording live and where I talk kind of at length about myself and my life. And I want to give a very special thank you to all of you who support me on Patreon, because quite honestly, you guys help me keep the lights out of my house. And I can't thank you enough for that. A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Canon Lando Higuchi, Chumbinski, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kyle, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Deanna Kraus, G Weevil 3, Chris Lovin, Freddy Krueger, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Miranda Jeffries, Hulgungshi, Justin Johnson, Raven Hart, Unknown Nobody, Michael Scarborough, Kazen, this is my real name, no shit, Jason VB Wilson, Infernal One, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Someone You Love, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much. Like, seriously. Thank you guys so, so much. And if you would like to be able to join them, you always can at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I love you guys. Seriously. All of you who support on Patreon, who follow, who subscribe, those of you who listen, and those of you who lurk. Thank you for the amazing 10 years and sweet dreams.